in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه من سنة بسنة من الدين أما بعد ما رأي من الدرس في الإسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته first thing that we'll be talking about today is the obligation or importance of da'wah and we'll go through very quickly some definition and terminologies and basic uh, terms and words and theory in terms of uh, da'wah itself. I know many of us, we know the obligation of da'wah, but just want to run down for those uh, who may be attending for the first time to give them a brief uh, insight into um, the whole topic of da'wah in Islam. How many of you are attending uh, a da'wah workshop for the first time? Like for the first time you... So this will be good for you as an introduction of what really da'wah is in Islam. Um, so this is our overview for this uh, first session where we'll go through definition, terminologies, the virtues or benefits of da'wah, its obligation, uh, is it fard or sunnah or wajib, you know, who should be doing it, uh, who is it for, and also the modalities of da'wah, there is something in theory and something in practice, you know, practically what we're talking about and theoretically what we're talking about. And then the methodology that we need to adopt, inshallah, in terms of uh, doing da'wah. So, first thing first, the word da'wah itself, the definition of the word, comes from the root word of da'a. Da'a means to invite, to call. You know, when you give a da'wah, you know, when you invite someone for dinner at your house, you are basically giving da'wah. That come have food with me at my house. So that is one form of da'wah on the basis of food. That's linguistically the meaning of da'wah, to invite someone, to call someone. Technically speaking in Islam, da'wah means that we are inviting someone to the word of Allah Taala. We are inviting people to and towards Allah and Islam. That is what the technicality of the word da'wah means. And that's why in Islam today, when we talk about the word da'wah, it does not mean food. Although food is attached with it. Like every session, you know, you have food today also. We have food, you know, last night. Food is everywhere. Wherever there's a Muslim, there has to be food. Muslims cannot live without food. You know that better than me. So that is why we understand that this initial explanation understands to give us a specific meaning and that is calling people towards Allah, towards Islam. Now, Dawah itself, a lot of times people say, like last night a brother was telling me that, you know, uh, what about the Muslims? We need to give Dawah to them. And I said, yes. Dawah has two uh, components. Component number one is giving Dawah to Muslims, which is known as Islah. You know, Dawah to Islah, which rectification or remodification, revival. Meaning somebody who's already a Muslim, you're giving them Dawah for Islah, for rectification, for morality, for bringing them becoming more practicing in Islam. And da'wah component number two is giving da'wah to non-Muslims to invite them to Islam and they would then convert and become Muslim. So yes, there is da'wah for Muslims and there's da'wah for non-Muslims, both. But usually we focus more and importance of more in da'wah to non-Muslims because they don't know anything about it. So we need to approach them and relate to them. What are the terminologies? Number one, da'i, the word da'i means the one who calls others to Allah. And the one who's mad'u, the one who is being called, the recipient, is known as mad'u. The female is known as da'iya. You know, da'i for male and da'iya for female. So males and females in Islam are inviting others to Islam. When you are calling someone, you are calling them to Allah. So you are the caller. The caller is da'i. And by default, whoever is a Muslim, by default, they are a da'i. I cannot say that I'm a Muslim, but I'm not a da'i. Because, as we will cover in the next few slides, that what makes us by default a da'i? What injunction, what obligation, what proof of hadith or Quran makes us obligated to be a da'i? But yes, bottom line is that if you have said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you have become a da'i. Because whatever you have tasted, whatever you have absorbed, you need to now share with others. And that is why in food, when you're eating alone, 
it feels very sad and dull. Am I right or wrong? When you're eating alone, you feel like lonely. But when you're eating with people, two, three people around your table, it's very lively. Am I right or wrong? You enjoy eating food with other people. Why? Because you're enjoying the food and you have other you know, brother or sister sitting around and they're also enjoying something that you're tasting. You're taking from the same pot, the same thing, and they're also enjoying. The same philosophy in Kalima Shahada. You are a Muslim. You're enjoying the fruits of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So how can you be selfish and be lonely and eat alone and absorb alone? You have to share this La ilaha illallah with others. And that's why I found this beautiful quote online. So I put it over here. I really love the wording because it rhymes a lot. Aspire to inspire before you expire. We all are going to expire, are we not? Nobody's going to live eternally. Our expiration date, when you go to the grocery store and you pick up something from the shelf, what's the first thing you look on it? Expiration date on the bottom, on the top, on the side. When is this thing going to expire? If it says July 7th, are you going to buy it? July 7th, 2018, are you going to buy it? No. Why? It expired. Because today is 7th. How fast can you consume it? We have an expiration date, but the only problem is it's not written on our forehead. It's not written on our face when we're going to expire. But each one of us has an expiry, expiry date. Is our date of death already ordained? Yes or no? Does Allah know when we're going to die? Do we know when we're going to die? No. And that is why it is uncertain. Uncertainty is there. You don't know your expiry date, but until your expiry date, open up this can, open up the lid of this thing, and come out and spread out before it's finished. That is why we, we need to use our life in the optimum productive manner. We don't know our expiry date. We don't know when we're going to end. So before the end, let us make the real end, which is akhirah, better for us. So aspire to inspire before you expire. Aspire, why? That you have an aspiration. You have a desire that you want to share La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah with everyone around you. And you aspire to do what? To inspire others. When people are listening to your message, they're getting inspired. Oh yeah? Is that what your prophet is? Oh yeah? Is that who your God is? Oh yeah? Is that what Islam is about? Oh yeah? Is this why you cover your hair and your head? Oh yeah? Is this why you have this beard? This is the reason? People are getting inspired. Those oohs and ahs that are coming out from their heart, it's coming because you are inspiring them. You are delivering the message of Allah SWT, whether in a subtle way, indirect way, or a direct way. Let's move on. So what is the virtue of this work? Why should we do this da'wah work? You know, a lot of times people say that da'wah is just for someone else to do. It's not my job. It's not for me. It is someone else. As long as a group of people are doing, a jama'ah is doing, an organization is doing, why should I be worried and concerned about? Well, here there's a virtue that, Allah, that Rasulullah told us many, many years back. 14 years back in Medina, Rasulullah said that if Allah guides one person through you, that is better for you than a whole big lot of red camels. The wording of the hadith in Arabic is خَيْرٌ مِنْ حُمُرُ النَّعْمِ You know, red camels. Red camels were aspired in those days. Red camels were one of the most coveted things, one of the most desired things by the Arabs. You know, camels for them was very great. And amongst camels, there was white, which is good. And amongst the camels, there was the red one, which is the greatest. But who are we to understand camels? Have you, we don't use camels. So let me explain to you what it means. Allah guides through you, one person is better than 1,000 red Ferraris that you can own in your house. A red Ferrari is a red camel. The Arabs were very fond of camels. It was a means of transportation. We'll take them in races, in places, and from one destination to another. A Ferrari would do the same thing. And we all know the value of importance and expensiveness of Ferrari. So what I'm saying is, the reason Rasulullah gave this analogy, this parable, this simile, Comparing da'wah and guidance to one person with camel is to show that, look, you desire materialistic things, you desire worldly things like camels or cars or whatnot. But guidance to one person through you is far, far much better than those worldly possessions that you may desire. There's nothing better than giving hidayah or the gift of hidayah to someone. That someone gets inspired 
and motivated by you and they say, I want to become like you. What do I need to do to become Muslim? And that is the most blessed moment of our lives. The day someone comes up to you in the face and says, I want to become a Muslim, can you help me? Wallahi, brothers and sisters, this is the most prized moment in our whole life when someone comes up to you and says, can you help me please? I want to share what you are sharing. And that is why Rasulullah is giving this virtue that is better than the materialistic worldly possession, whether it's in terms of cattle, in terms of you know, horses, in terms of camels, in terms of whatever you may call it. Even in today's time, you can say instead of owning a mansion, it's better that Allah guides a person through us. Instead of owning a yacht or a boat or an RV or a summer home somewhere in Florida or Texas, it's better that Allah guides someone through us to Islam. And the reason for all of these virtues and is that Rasulullah and Allah SWT are motivating us to invite others to Islam. This is the real motivation. That we don't want to go to Jannah alone. We want to go with our family members and we want to go with as many people in our lives that we have met. You meet anyone for one time in this world, your desire should be that Allah reunite us in Jannah. I may come here to, today, this weekend, and then when I go back, we end. We may never see each other again. We are so far apart. But our desire should be that Allah reunite us, reconnect us in Jannah. And in Jannah, there will be so many people who will say, Oh, I remember you. Oh, I remember you. Even though you did not live in the same city, same town. But they remember you because you met each other in dunya, somewhere, at some place. Like it happens in dunya right now. That you go to a convention and you meet someone one time and then you meet them again at some masjid and say, your face looks familiar to me. I think I've seen you somewhere. Yeah, I was at that convention and I met you over there. This is going to happen in Jannah. They're going to say, your face looks familiar. Yes, I was in America. I was in California. I was in Bay Area. I was in Cupertino. I was in MCA and so on and so forth. How beautiful it would be in Jannah that we are reunited with the people whom we met in dunya. So what are the benefits of da'wah? Why, why should we do this work? What benefit it, and dividends it brings us? To? Number one and the most important, especially it's the biggest challenge in America right now, like I was speaking last night. The biggest challenge are misconceptions and misnomers about Islam in this society. There are so many confusions. There are so many misconceptions that Americans have about us and about Islam. I'll give you a simple, very simple one. Very common one that we get so much on the hotline or even at a Dawa booth at a Dawa festival that you are, you know, you guys really oppress your women, right? You suppress the women. You don't give them their rights. No. What makes you think? Well, they have to cover from head to toe and that's a sign of subjugation. That's a sign of oppression and dhulm. That's a sign of, you know, suppressing them and their rights, not giving them the freedom to wear what they want. This is a big misconception, isn't it? Because this is, we don't force women. Allah has ordained in the Quran. And the women who are wearing that are wearing with their own pleasure, with their own free will, with their freedom. They know what Allah's injunction is for them. It's not the men forcing doing that. Another very common misconception. This is one very funny one. You know, you guys have beards. I know why you have it, because you have a lot of pimples. You have a lot of things on your cheeks. So you want to hide that by just having a beard. Isn't that so? You're like, I heard Muslims are very ugly people. So the best way to hide your face is just to grow a long hair out there. Misconceptions, as trivial as this may sound. But they are there because you know what? These people are getting their information from where? Hmm? Sorry? By who? Anti-Islamists. That's one source. What else? Fox News. That's the second source. Media. Meaning anti-Islamist means human beings. They're getting their, what I'm talking about is sources. Human beings who are ill-informed about Islam, they're telling. Media who has a personal vendetta agenda to defame Islam. Second source. Third source. Thank you very much, sister. Yes, she is right. Non-practicing Muslims. A lot of damage is done. A big challenge for us Muslims is non-practicing Muslims. Oh, who said? We don't have to pray. You know, if you want to pray, you can go. But you don't have to really pray. I've had people tell me that. 
you don't really have to cover. That's a cultural thing. You know, back then in Arabia, 1400 years ago, those women, they were like uneducated. They didn't go to college. They didn't know anything. So their men said, just cover yourself up like a goat or a sheep or a cow that you cover it up. Misconceptions that are coming through non-practicing Muslims. You don't have to fast. If you want to fast, it's fine. But it's, you're not really obligated to fast. And when you ask them, who told you that? Oh, my friend. He works with me at the company, my colleague, because he doesn't fast. My friend, a colleague, a worker, she doesn't wear. She wears tank tops and mini skirts because that's, that's what it is. You have freedom to wear you want. Non-practicing Muslims are a source of information being fed to people. So that's three. Fourth source. Where else people get the information from about Islam? And then they get confused and misconceived. Internet, yes. So many websites. We get so many callers on the hotline saying, I read this on the website. I read that on this website. That website says this. That website says that. And then these websites are purposely made by people who don't like Islam. What else is another source besides these four? There are so many we can go on on it, but I just want to list five to show you how dangerous it is out there. Another fifth one, can somebody give me? Your own imagination. Yes. They saw you doing something, they heard you over you something, and they imagined. Like they were standing in the line. Two, Mus two Muslims were also standing in the line. And those two Muslims were talking to each other. I heard they were planning to do something. They were using words like, you got it, right? Yeah, I got it, right. That means they're going to do something. They're probably going to blow up something. You got it, I got it. What does that make you saying that you're going to blow up a building? Imagination. These people are dangerous. I heard them. They were standing in the line at McDonald's, Burger King, buying a burger. I just overheard them. People are having paranoia. So when they hear Muslims talking, they have this misconceived notion already, and then they connect it to it. Oh, he said, I got it. And he said, yes, I really got it. <laughs> you could get anything. Imagination is danger for ill information. And that is why removing misconceptions is one of the biggest product or benefit of da'wah. The more we talk about Islam, the more authentic, credible source we are, the more credible knowledge is passing out to people. And it is very important to conquer or fight Islamophobia. Ever since 9-11, I know many of you have been living in this country for a long time. You have seen the golden days of Islam. I call the golden days of Islam pre-9-11. From 60s, 50s and 60s that Muslims have been coming here. From 50s and 60s up until 2001. Golden days. I still remember those beautiful days of the 90s decade, you know. 90s decade. You could do whatever you want. You could pray on the airport. Nobody would even freak out at you. You can do anything in the park. You could be washing your foot in the basin, making wudu at a general restroom in a park. Nobody's going to freak out or get scared on you. What are you going to do? Are you about to blow up? Yeah, I need to wash myself before blowing up. That's <laughs> the kind of stupidity that people have in their mind. So that was the golden era. We didn't have any fear. We were living fearless in America. We had no hatred. Hardly ever you heard any incidences in the 80s and 70s and 90s that somebody, you know, spit on you, somebody pulled your hijab, somebody punched you, somebody pushed you, somebody shoved you. Tell me, do you know, did you ever hear? I mean, I lived here in the 90s. Those of you lived in 80s and 90s, did you ever hear something like that? I, I really seldom recall. But come 9-11, the world changes apart, 180 degrees. And now we have to stand up for justice. So that is why we need to spread Islam to all parts of the world. Now when we say we need to spread Islam, let me correct myself that nobody has any misconception of what I'm saying. A lot of times people take this talk, and I know it's being recorded, and a lot of times people see the recording and say, oh, that imam was talking about doing missionary work, that imam was proselytizing, that imam was trying to, you know, convince people that we have to just convert people. No. We have to understand the biggest misconception here in da'wah, in Islam. Spreading Islam does not at all mean converting people. Am I right or wrong? Correct me. If you think otherwise, tell me. Stop me right now. Imam, you're wrong. Spreading Islam means you have to convert people. Nowhere in the Quran Allah says spreading Islam means converting in Islam. 
Is there any ayah in the Quran? Can you show me, please? I'll wait here. You have a smartphone? You have a Quran? You can open. If you don't have an ayah, I'll show you an ayah. Do we have any ayah in the Quran? Surah Baqarah, Surah 2. Allah says in verse 256, لا إقراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي لا إقراه في الدين There is no compulsion in Islam Spreading the word of Islam does not at all mean converting people Because if it meant that Allah would not have revealed this ayah in Surah Baqarah Surah number 2 verse number 256 لا إقراه في الدين No compulsion in Islam when you're listening about Islam, when you're learning about Islam and its values and etiquettes and manners, it does not at all compel you, obligate you to convert. Because Allah the Creator is saying, لا إقراه في الدين. No compulsion. قد تبين الرشد من الغي. The righteousness, the goodness is very clear and distinct from falsehood. See, when you spread Islam, when you spread truthfulness, when you spread truth, Falsehood automatically will die. Right or wrong? If you're just presenting truth after truth, and there are so many lies about us Muslims out there, the lies will fall dead on the ground. Allah says that in the Quran, Surah Bani Israel, Surah 17, Surah Isra. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَذَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا This is the ayah in the Quran. Allah is saying, translation, say, Truth has come. Qul jaa al-haq. Say, truth has come. What is the truth? Al-Qur'an. Kalam of Allah. You talk about the Qur'an, it's truth. Qul jaa al-haq. Wa dhahaq al-batil. And batil, falsehood. All false ideologies. All false beliefs and systems will die. Because truth is here. Why? Inna al-batil akana zahuqa. Verily, falsehood was ordained and doomed by default. Falsehood was only standing upright because of what? Why was falsehood standing upright? Because of what? Because of absence of what? Truth. An absence of truthful people. We are truthful people, am I not? We are not. Are we not truthful people? What does Islam teach us? Don't lie. Huh? Allah says in the Quran that Allah's curse be on the liars. So we are not liars. We are truthful people. But if these truthful people are sleeping, what is falsehood going to do day in and day out? Day and night, what is falsehood going to do? Rise. You know, people today make excuses, blame. Oh, Islamophobes, you know, the anti-Islamists, the haters, they're doing a lot of work. You know, they're spreading lies and falsehood. We can't match up with them. We can't do enough with them. And I beg to defer. I say, they're not doing anything. If you compare the amount of work that they're doing, it's like just one iota, one inch. But because truthful people are sleeping or absent, because truth is absent, so falsehood is having a, what they call that in American cliche? Huh? A field day. Make hay while the sun shines. And the sun always shines in California. We know that very well. So you all should be making a lot of hay. How come I didn't see that at SOFO Airport when we landed? A lot of haystacks over there. You know, we have a lot of rain over there in the East Coast. New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. But you have a lot of sunshine. And that is why it should be there. So remember, truthful people need to mobilize and motivate and come out more. So automatically falsehood will die. Why? Because Allah has given every human being a common sense. And in the common sense tells us that to compare. When you compare lie with truth, your brain tells you to accept the truth. Am I right or wrong? This is natural human, this is natural psychology, natural human instinct. Forget religion for a second. Put religion aside. When anybody presents, with, presents to you a truth and a lie, what do you naturally usually accept? The lie or the truth? Because we are created on fitrah. Allah says in the Quran, فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّذِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ The fitrah, the human instinct that Allah has created human beings with is to recognize truthfulness. Recognize truthfulness. And that is why everybody is a born Muslim. Did you know that? 
And that's why we call them rewords and not converts. Because the English word convert, you know, gives a connotation as if this person was never a Muslim and they converted to Islam. But the English word reword, you know, alludes to or implies that they were a Muslim, but they just got lost in the wilderness and now they have come back. And how do we know that Muslim, uh, that everybody is a born Muslim? Like I recited the ayah in the Quran, Surah Rome, Surah 30, verse number 30. And by the hadith of Rasulullah, he said very clearly, very distinctly, Rasulullah said, Kullu mauludin yulidu ala al-fitra. Every newborn child is born on the fitra, born on the natural human instinct to recognize Allah. And that is why the rewords, when they learn about Islam, when they learn about truthfulness, they accept Islam and they revert. And that's the reason we call them revert. Because all their life they were lost. All their life they were searching for truth. Finally, when truth came to them, they grabbed it. And they said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Rasulullah. We need to only create the thirst for truth and people will come. We need to only create the curiosity to search the truth and people will come. We don't need to push and shove people into Islam. Nobody's saying that. We only need to create a thirst for that. And that tells us that we have an obligation to do. As you see this ayah, Allah said, I recited this ayah last night, so I won't go over it again, but you already know. I explained this ayah that who is better in speech than the one who invites people to Allah and righteousness and says and does righteous good deeds and says, indeed, I am of the Muslims. I gave a very detailed, lengthy explanation last night, so I will skip that. If you were not here last night, no problem, it was recorded. You can get the recordings, inshallah, from Ikna Bay Area chapter, inshallah, the San Francisco. I believe there's a YouTube channel, right? So you can just go to the YouTube channel and see the detail of this explanation. I'll go to the next ayah, the Surah Yusuf, Surah 12. Allah SWT says in verse number 108, Translation say, this is my way, I invite Allah, I invite to Allah with insight and, and those who follow me. And exalted is Allah and I'm not those, of who, those who associate partners with Him. What is the word over here that obligates us to become da'i and give da'wah? It is the part of Arabic that says, وَمَنِتَّبَعَنِي this ayah is directly addressing our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Allah is saying to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Say, Qul. Every time you see the word Qul in Arabic, in the Quran, the first addressee, the first mukhatib, the first person to be addressed is Rasulullah Sallallahu It's as if Allah is saying, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Say this. And then through Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi O Muslims, say this. So Allah is saying to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Say, say what? قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِ Say, this is my path. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I, Muhammad, called people to Allah. عَلَى بَصِيرًا Upon insight, upon clear, vivid proofs. وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي And whoever follows me. مَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Whoever follows me. Whoever follows me means, means who? Me and you. We follow who? Who do we follow? Michael Jackson? No, Muhammad So if we follow Muhammad we are included in this ayah. Am I right or wrong? Nobody can deny the obligation, the fard, the wajib of giving da'wah. Because this ayah is clearly saying, if anybody, brothers and sisters, if anybody challenges you and says, show me, show me where in the Quran Allah says we have to be da'i, each one has to be da'i, tell them, read Surah Yusuf, Surah number 12, ayah number 108. Where Allah says to Muhammad Sallam that I am on the path and I call towards the path and my followers call to path. So if you are a follower of Muhammad Sallam, you are included in this ayah. And since you are included in this ayah, that means now after the passing away of Muhammad Sallam, it is your duty to pass the message of Muhammad Sallam to others. This ayah com complemented by the hadith of Rasul Sallam that I said last night also. In the Hajjatul Wada, in the farewell Hajj, Rasulullah gave a sermon, and in the sermon he said, فَلْيُبَلِّغَ الشَّاهِدْ الْغَائِبِ So let the ones who are present here today transfer, convey to the people who are غَائِب, who are absent, meaning who will come in the future. 
Or it also means those who are not present there at the farewell Hajj in Mecca in front of Susan. So this hadith, Fal yuballigh al-shahid al-ghaib, automatically obligates us, makes it fort for us to pass on the message of Muhammad Sallam to others. I cannot shy away from this obligation. I cannot say, oh, nowhere in the Quran, nowhere in the hadith, it tells me that I, it is my duty. No, I gave you an ayah and I gave you the hadith. It is my duty. And yes, Allah will ask me and ask all of us on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Yawm Al-Hisab, Yawm Al-Kitab, on the day of judgment, on the day of accountability, on the day of questioning, Allah will ask us, I, Allah, placed you in California, in Bay Area. What did you do for my deen? What answer do we have? Oh, I was very busy making dollars. I was very busy making hay while the sun shines. I was very busy with my kids. I was very busy with my job, my two jobs, my three jobs. I was very busy with my family. I was traveling a lot for job, for family. I had no time for you, Allah. What? You had no time for me? Can we imagine saying this to Allah on Yom Al Qiyamah? You're standing there, there are billions of people, Allah is there and asking you, what did you do and I placed you in Bay Area, California? And you say, Allah, I had no time for you. When I think of this, it makes me cry. It makes me shake. How will I show my face to Allah? He is the one who brought me in America. Did you come here? I'm talking to the immigrants, not the born. Born people, for a second, be on the side. People who came here, we think that we got the visa, we got the citizenship, we got the green card because of our talent, our skill, because I applied, I filled the application, I did this. No, 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 no. There are thousands of people who exactly like you applied, filled forms, did everything, went post to post to get a visa, but every time they went there, rejected, rejected, declined, rejected, declined, rejected. Just because you got in on the first try does not make you any better than them. So what does that explain to us? That we came here as immigrants by the will of Allah, by the permission of Allah. So uh, this is also a ni'mah. Right? This is also a ni'mah, a blessing, bounty. So many people got denied. And whose will was it that they got denied? Whose permission was it that they got rejected? Again, Allah. Allah said, you cannot go to America. Allah said, you cannot go to America. Allah said, you cannot go to America. They didn't come. They stayed there. But if you ask them today even, you want to come to America? Yeah, please tell me how. Even a 70-year-old woman, you, a man or woman, you ask them, yeah, how can I get there? So what we have learned, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, is that if we are here, we are here for a purpose. A divine intervention, a divine purpose. That he brought us here. He made our children to be born here. And there is a reason behind why he made, Allah made our children to be born here. Born and raised in USA. Citizens of this country. Because this is the obligation that he has sent us with. Ud'uhum ila al-Islam wa akhbirhum bima yuhibbu alayhim. Bima yajibu alayhim. Allah, Rasulullah is saying, call them to Islam. And inform them, akhbirhum, about what is obligatory duties regarding Allah for them. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us for a purpose. Yes, we may have come here for a better job. We may have come here to get married to somebody. We may have come here to study on a student visa and decided to stay back. We may have come here for some visit and then we decided to stay back. We may have come here for some business. We had a company somewhere. We came here, did a business. We're about to go back, but changed mind, stayed back. I'm, what I'm saying is no matter what reason we came here for But now that we are living here Our reason should be both Dunya and deen Dunya and akhirah Both Now that Allah has put me here I have an obligation And my obligation is to spread this deen My obligation is not at all Not at all to convert anybody I don't want America to become Islam I don't want America to become all Muslims I am just sharing Islam And if in my sharing People convert or revert, it is their choice, their prerogative. Nothing that I can stop. You know, we get so many times calls on the hotline, ASIS of Islam hotline, and they, these like um, really hate people, people from Texas and Florida and Tennessee, Alabama, you know, old New Orleans, South people calling, you know, why all here? Why all here to get over America? 
You know, you want to take over America? Why don't you all go back to where you came from? You know, this is the biggest misconception they have that, oh, Muslims are coming over and they're going to raise the flag of Islam. And the flag of USA is going to be going now. Where did they get this misconception? Did anybody say that? Did you say that when you came here? Did you say that at the visa application at the US embassy? After coming here and landing here, whether in JFK or Ellis Island or SF4, anywhere you landed, is that what you spread? How did these people get this notion in their mind, these people are here to get us and get over this? Somebody's feeding them wrong information, lies, false, batil, kazib. So we need to speak the truth. And that is why we need to spread this message. Now the biggest excuse that people give, I've heard this excuse so many times, a hundred times, more than a hundred times. Oh brother, but I don't know anything about Islam. I can't give da'wah. I'm not an alim. I'm not a scholar. I'm not a mufti. I'm not a sheikh. I'm not a hafiz. I'm not a qari. You know, I'm not Muslim. I'm not even a practicing Muslim. I just pray two, three times a day. You expect me to give da'wah? Of course, I do expect. Because it's not me who's expecting. It's the hadith of Rasulullah. Qala Rasulullah Balligu anni walu ayah. Convey about me even if it's only one ayah, one sentence. Rasulullah is responding to the excuse that people give that, oh, I am not learned enough. I don't have enough knowledge, ilm to give da'wah. Rasulullah remove this excuse right down to the one bare minimum level. You know one ayah? I'm asking you, you know one ayah? How many of you know one ayah? Raise your hand. No, just one ayah. Every hand should go up, right? Yeah. So all of you are guys. Automatically, by default. He said this, look. Talk about me, spread message about me, even if you know one hadith, one ayah. One aspect of Rasulullah you know, spread it. One aspect of Allah, mother, one sifa, one feature, characteristic of Allah you know, spread it. Talk about it. That's it. Who said you have to go and study? Yes, if you go and study, that's good, that's better. You take classes, you take courses, you know, Maghrib, Bayina, Yaqeen. There are so many institutes now over here. You know, this is also thanks and barakah to Allah, from Allah. Barakah from Allah that we now have. I remember when I was in college, going in college over here in America back in the early days, you know, if you wanted to study Islam, you had no institute. No university, nothing, no institute. You had to go overseas. You had to go to Medina or Jordan or Egypt, Cairo, or Pakistan, or India to study Islam. Thanks now that our kids, our children, our youngsters, teenagers don't have to go overseas. They can be right here in front of our own eyes, parents' eyes, and still study Islam. Isn't this a barakah? Isn't this a na'mah, a blessing? Ask the people who left their family, who left their parents, and went overseas to study, to become an imam, to become a sheikh, to become something. And then they came back after so many years of separation. Now we have this blessing in America. American Muslims have really worked hard. American Muslims are one of the most hard-working communities of America. We came here first in the 50s and 60s, by we means the immigrants. Of course, there were Muslims here before us, the African Americans, the indigenous Muslims. And yes, they were working and they were striving and struggling. But a big flux, a big influx came from 50s and 60s and 70s. So American Muslims have been coming from 50s, 60s, 70s. First they came here, they built masajid. After they got enough masajid, they said, okay, now we have a masjid. What should we do next? Let's build what? Islamic schools. We need to protect our children. We need to have them in Islamic school. All right. Masajid, Islamic schools. When they got Islamic schools, enough built around. All right, we need to protect our children more. So now let's build what? Huh? <laughs> Youth centers, community centers, where our children can socialize, our community can socialize. Instead of renting a hotel at Hyatt Regency or Marriott or Sheraton or Hilton, Let's have a banquet hall. Well, let's have a community center. Masjid, Islamic school, community center. Full course gym. Kids can play over there. They don't have to go to YMCA or play somewhere else. So masjid, Islamic schools, community centers. Then, like you said, institutions, constituencies. The fourth stage. Am I talking sense or it doesn't make sense? Yeah. See the gradual, the gradual rising of Muslims, American Muslims? The need of the hour. Initial need was masajid. Second need was Islamic schools. Third need was, we have a school, we have a masjid, but our kids are 
hanging out somewhere else, let's bring them in. So we have a gym, we have a playroom, we have a community center, we have discussion, we have a hall. You want to have a aqiqa, a walima, a wedding, you have the place in your own place. Yes, brother? Very good. This is one of the counter arguments that people raise, excuse also. But it's not dangerous. Let me tell you what. By ayah, it means here, the word ayah does not really only, on, does not only mean an ayah, an ayah of the Quran. It also means that a sign, a symbol, sha'ar of Islam. Something that you uh, practice. Something that you adopt and adapt in your life. So you can share that of Islam. Any aspect over here, when we're talking about ayah, we're not just talking about the ayah Qur'aniya. But ayah diniya, anything that you practice as Islam. Yes, you are right that you need to have knowledge. And when you talk about basira, of course, the person who knows that one ayah, he or she who knows that very well, they are on the basira for that ayah. So at least that aspect or that knowledge that they have absorbed, that they have understood, they can pass that. We're not asking them to spread something else about Islam, something they don't know. Of course, what is majhul, they don't know. What is ma'roof, they know. So whatever ma'roof they know, they spread. And that is what Allah says in the Qur'an. The response to your question is in the Qur'an. Allah says, Amar bil ma'roof wa nahi al-munkar. Wal mu'minin wal mu'minat ba'aduhum awliya u ba'ad. Ya'muruna bil ma'roof wa yanhawna al-munkar. Believers are friends and protectors of one another. They enjoin what is ma'roof, good. So that good must be well entrenched, well explained in their mind. That is why they know it's ma'roof and they're practicing it. And that is why they're going to spread that ma'roof to others. But something that is majhul, that is unknown, they don't know any knowledge about, yes, you're right, that is dangerous. If I don't know something about a specific aspect of salah and I start spreading it out, I may be doing more damage and harm. But here the hadith, let me correct it, here the hadith and the ayah is saying whatever you know very well, you're deeply ingrained. You go talk about it. You know about salah, you know why you pray five times a day, yeah. And you know how many rakah you're praying in five times? Yeah, just go talk about that. We pray because we connect to God. We pray because it's meditation. We pray because it's spirituality. We pray because we communicate to Allah. That's all. Ayah. You don't have to go and talk about the fadail of, uh, uh, of salah, the fiqh of salah, the fiqh of wudu, the fiqh of this. No. We're only talking about spreading the message to other. So that the other person who's not a Muslim knows why we pray, knows why she covers, know why he has a beard, know why he wears this attire. That's all. Information, technology. We are living in an IT era. Knowledge today is on your fingertips. Fingertips, right? Today, knowledge travels so fast. You know, the event happens here. In two seconds, it's in Australia. Yes, wallahi, believe you me. Something happened here, right here in MCA. In Sydney, Australia, you, they know already about it. You get a phone call. Salaam alaikum, brother Ahmed. What happened over there in Santa Clara on Scott Boulevard? How do you know? You're in Sydney. Oh, I got a WhatsApp message. <laughs> Technology, information, rapid fire. We're living in an era of rapid knowledge transfer. And that's why I say sometimes, jokingly, you know, sometimes people ask me, brother, you know when Imam Mahdi is going to come? You know that Imam is going to come at the end of time? So they sometimes, you know, especially youth, they ask a lot, Imam, when is Imam Mahdi going to come? I said, look, don't worry about it. Because when he comes, you will be the first to know. And he says, whoa, really, why? I said, your phone will have images. <laughs> the phone will be like bursting open. Imam is here, Imam Mahdi is here. Imam. Today, anything happens overseas, you know in seconds, right? Something happened in India, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. You wake up on your bed, just lying in the bed, you're looking at your phone, you have messages, WhatsApp messages, Messenger, Facebook, Twitter, whatnot. Technology is so rapid. That now knowledge is not hidden. Knowledge cannot be reserved. And that tells us why Allah revealed the first ayah 
اقرا باسم ربك الذي خلق 1450 years ago Allah said to Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم اقرا اقرا because this knowledge this reciting and reading will take you to heights of glory today whoever is at the helm of affairs of knowledge today whoever has the reins of knowledge look where they are they are on the top of the mountain and those who are not in the reins of knowledge look where they are very low somewhere down there look what look what happening in our muslim countries back home in terms of knowledge and look how in this country we see knowledge spreading like wildfire and with technology knowledge has gone four times faster than anything and we are going even much i mean sometimes i ask myself we're going to die we're going to grave our children our grandchildren what kind of technology will they have my 9 year old son he said you know baba you guys are old school you will, you guys carry this big huge devices in our time this is a 9 year old kid my son telling in our time we won't carry these things we'll have a screen invisible screen you won't have a watch you have an apple watch today or a samsung watch or something you won't have watch your skin will be there dial there yes i'll be there a second skin you know like sometimes they they tell you uh some brothers tell me that in hollywood movies they show technology scientific things you know like uh in the in the movies they show that technology has gone so far that they have screen invisible screens and they are you know touching things and people are imagining right now so knowledge will spread like wildfire and as the world progresses further and further towards qiyamah knowledge is going to explode these devices will become obsolete anybody here heard about floppy disk i'm from the era of floppy disk anybody know floppy disk only you those who didn't raise your hand you know what a floppy disk is to you ask somebody you have a floppy disk today they say what what was that was that from the dinosaurs <laughs> floppy disk I'm from the I'm from the generation of floppy disk. To transfer a file, I need to have a floppy disk. That big five and a quarter is this big. Today, brother Khalid just brought one cable. He touched it. He got this thing. Back in the days, we couldn't do this. We had to have the floppy disk. You didn't have it. You wouldn't see my presentation right now. So you are la- we are laughing right now on floppy disk. Our children will be laughing. Ah, oh, they used to have a smartphone, iPhones. You know, old age, dinosaur time. You don't need these devices. I have it in my finger, I have it in my skin. I can see it in front of my eyes, you know, with this Google uh, I mean, you're living in Silicon Valley, you are at the brink of explosion of knowledge. Google created these glasses, you know, you can see everything in the glass. This is now in 2018 Google has that. 10 years from now, imagine what you have, a chip in your eye. I can see what's behind your eye. Oh, this is dangerous. Let me put my glasses on. I don't want to go that far. But in that technology era, when you don't need glasses everything is in your eye or everything is in a chip where will la ilaha illallah muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam be where will muhammad rasulullah will be where is la ilaha illallah at that time we need to take advantage of these technology we need to take advantage of these devices and tools and use it for the sake of islam spreading the message so we move on which was my next topic the modalities of da'wah people sometimes always think of old school dawa means only talking to somebody face to face i have to be at a dawa table i have to be at a dawa booth i have to be in a church or in a masjid interfaith dialogue seminar i have to see somebody to tell them about islam no that's the time of the past technology has taken you beyond barriers you could be sitting right here in santa clara california and talking to somebody in fiji island you know where fiji island is Well, you live in the West Coast. You should know that it's closer from West Coast, from East Coast. I ask this in East Coast, nobody says I don't know. I mean, nobody says I know. They all say I don't know. But you should be knowing Fiji Island is just a few hours, not drive, airplane. It's the island right in front of New Zealand, so you can go from LA or San Francisco straight to Fiji Island, the island where the sun rises first. So that's why I say for for <laughs> for moon sighting. Muslim ummah should have a committee over there. If they see the moon in Fiji, everybody else should have it. If they don't see it there, nobody should have it. So in terms of dawa, we have no barriers now. We are borderless, barrierless. And we have an a abundance of tools. You have social media, all right? You have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, this, that, what? You can use all of that for the sake of dawa. 
Don't use Twitter, Snapchat just for entertainment and shul, mashgala, you know, I'm putting this, I'm eating a popcorn right now. Okay, how about that? Forget the popcorn. I'm talking about Allah right now. How about that? I'm talking about Muhammad Sallam. How about that? Or any of the other devices. And then you have, like I said, speech, talking to people. You know, inviting, if somebody is saying, we need a speaker in this place to talk about Islam, volunteer. You just raise your hand. Yes, I can do that. Why does only the imams of masajid have to volunteer to speak? Why can't any one of us speak? Oh no, I'm not good at public speaking. I don't know how to speak. Allah will make you speak. The same Allah who made Musa al-Islam speak. Musa who used to stutter. He used to stutter. Allah made him speak in front of the biggest tyrant of the world at that time. Fir'aun. Go, you and Harun, to him and say a word that is layin, lean. So Allah made Musa Islam speak. He can make any one of us speak. Because remember, the intention, niya should be there. I want to speak for the sake of Allah. I want to spread the message of Allah. So I can do any of the things. I can use technology. I can use a blog. I can use a YouTube. You have phones. You have... Recording devices, you can, you can record at 10 second, 20 second, 30 second short messages. Load it up in YouTube. You don't have to be part of some masjid or organization. It's good if you are, but you can just load it up on YouTube. Who knows how many views you'll get. Some random guy or some random woman will be searching online on YouTube. They bump into your video. You, they listen to you on YouTube, your message. And you have done your job of spreading. That is what he's saying. You know, spread even one ayah. And Allah is saying in the Quran, وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغ Upon us is nothing except the message, the balaag, the spreading. Our job is not to convince somebody. Are you convinced? You want to take the shahada now? Should I help you? That's not our job. Yeah, if somebody is convinced, we can do that for them. But that is not the end goal, end result that we're looking for. We need to convey in a multitude of ways. These are some of the ways that I'm telling you. But there are many other ways. You can write articles for the local newspaper. You know, as much as technology is there and as much as all the newspapers have their own online app website and apps and all that, still some people are old school and they have the print newspaper, the paper. It comes out, you know, like the San Jose Times or something over here? Sorry? Mercury News. They still have the Mercury News in paper format. So you can write articles for that. You can write in the op-ed, opinion, editor's opinion page. You voice your opinion about any issue and write in there. There are newsletters, there are magazines for various organizations. Magazines for medical association, magazines for accountants, you know, magazines for engineers, magazines for things. You don't have to write in there an Islamic article. You write something about that topic of that magazine and somewhere in there, by the way, Islam talks about this. You just insert one line, one ayah, one hadith, and you've done your job in the article. You can have a wee blog, video blog. You can have a literal blog, blogging, just typing on a page. And people come from different parts of the world surfing around. They bump into, stalk onto you, uh, on, stomp onto your page. You can do many kinds of other activities. by if you know how to speak, if you know how to do, you know, deliver a message, you gather some people and say, hey, come, I want to teach you and train you how to speak. If somebody knows something, they need to transfer that skill, that talent to others so that others can benefit and they become the more the merrier. We should not hide our talents. We should not hide our skills. That, oh, no, no, they're going to learn from me. So they're going to get ahead of me. I want to I wanna just hide this to myself. I just want to keep it to myself. No, if 100 people can speak here, that's better. That's 1,000 more people that you can reach. But if only one person is a speaker and he is going around or she is going around everywhere, how much can they shake? Then can they go? But the methodology has to be very clear. And that is what Allah has said in the Quran, Surah Nahl, Surah 16. That, Udhu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mawida wal mawida al hasana wa jadil hum bil leti hi ahsan. Allah SWT is saying, Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom. Three things Allah has mentioned in this ayah. Look. Number one, hikmah, wisdom. Number two, mawida hasana, a fair warning, a good warning. Mu'idha, the word Mu'idha means warning, in dhar. So, Mu'idha hasana means a good warning, a fair warning, a fair information, instruction, that you alert someone. You know, if I alert you, like he's coming to alert me, your time is, you know, he's giving me a Mu'idha hasana. 
Because if there was not Mu'adh al-Hasana, he's going to come and say, Brother, stop right now. Close the mic. So Mu'adh al-Hasana means that you do in a polite, kind, gentle way to inform and alert the person what is about. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنَ Look, Allah says, and then, if they argue, <coughs> the people who you're talking to, if they argue with you, then you argue with them back or discuss with them or dialogue with them back in a way that is better than that. A lot of times people have misconception about this ayah. They think that here, جَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنَ means that you debate with people, you argue with people, argumentation. لَا كَلَّ Imam Al-Razi in his Tafsir Al-Kabir says that if Allah wanted us to argue, he would have said, وَتُجَادِلُوا بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ فِعْلْ مُضَارِعْ A present tense verb. Those who have, if you are Arabs, you know in Arabic there is فِعْلْ مَاضِي فِعْلْ مُضَارِعْ So Allah is saying, وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ It is in Madi present tense that, meaning Allah is saying, if they argue with you, they are the initiator of the starter of the argument, then you just respond to them in a better way. بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ but if that argument goes into a fight or something worse, then stop, move back. How we know that? Allah says in the Quran, الْجَاهِلُونَ And when the ignorant people argue with them, fight with them, these people, the law-abiding, Muslim-loving, peace-loving people, they say, salama, salam, peace. I don't want to argue. I don't want to fight. I want to just talk and respond. So that is why these three things are important to understand. And <clears throat> a lot of times people say, what are the consequences? And I'll finish with this for the tea break, chai break. What are the consequences if we don't do da'wah? What will happen, you know? Will the sky fall apart? Will the earth split apart and we're going to go down in the earth? What's the big disaster is going to happen? Yes, it is something like that. Biggest consequence, people will not know about Islam or the message. Next thing, people will be having misconceptions and confusions and the lies that others are spreading, people will start believing in the lies. You know, I think there's a proverb or cliche that says, if you repeat lies long enough, they become truth. If somebody keeps bombarding you with lies, lie, 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 it becomes a truth. You start believing in it. And when someone comes, hey, this is a lie, you say, no, 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 look, everybody's saying it. The whole world is saying it. How can it be a lie? It's the truth. Because everybody is joined in the bandwagon of lying. And that is why truth needs to prevail. Another biggest, another biggest consequence, biggest consequence for us, the Muslim, we'll be deprived of the ajr and reward of da'wah. There's a big reward. Whether somebody converts or not, we doing our job has a big, huge reward for that. Yes, it is not a materialistic, worldly reward. It's not something tangible. I won't get an iPhone X for giving da'wah. I won't get a laptop for giving da'wah. I won't get a Lexus or a Benz for giving da'wah. But I'll get something bigger than all of these things in akhirah. It is reserved for me. My reward, al-ajru ma'allah. My reward is with Allah. And that will come at a later time. When we go in our barzakh. You know barzakh? The grave. Our barzakh is the place where we stay until yawm al-qiyamah. In the barzakh, Allah will show us the fruits and dividends of the da'wah that we did on this earth. And also the Muslim society will become isolated. If we don't do da'wah, we will remain to be isolated, conservative, you know, introvert. <coughs> and nobody knows about us, nobody interacts with us, nobody shares with us. And now, which the brother said, what are some of the etiquettes of being da'wah? After the chai, after the tea, we'll go over this. I'll just give you the title right now. Yes, when you decide and intend to start doing da'wah, yes, it is very, very important, it is imperative that you start a path of knowledge. You start reading books, start watching lectures. You have so many ulama, so many scholars now on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. You have their videos. You can just watch that. You know, I don't want to take names to single out any one scholar or speaker, but there's so many of them that are now available on YouTube. In your free time, you could be just watching on your smartphone, on your laptop, on your iPad. The videos, learning, 10 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute videos, you're getting knowledge. You know, knowledge now is not just reserved to books, but you can even go and watch videos or listen to audio lectures, improve your knowledge, increase yourself. And understand that through knowledge comes kindness and gentleness because knowledge makes a person humble. Knowledge makes a person with humility. And then through that, when they're humble and having humility, through that comes wisdom, hikmah. They learn, what is hikmah? Understanding, it is a maturity. 
and the senior citizens have the most hikmah because someone who has lived their life 60, 70, 80 years, they have seen it all, they have done it all, they have experienced it all. They have so much plethora of experience now in their brain that they know how to tackle this situation, how to tackle that situation, what to adapt here, what to adapt there. This is experience. That is why companies ask you, how much experience do you have in your resume and your CV? If you have no experience, you know, I know people get frustrated. You know, if I don't work, how am I going to get experience? But the reason they're asking experience is because they want to know if you've been in a prior situation like that. So that when the company faces that problem, you can deal it. <coughs> Same thing in life. When somebody is senior citizen, not old, nobody's old. We're only old when we go to the grave. Until 80 year old, you're just senior. And the older you are, I mean the senior you are, the senior citizen, the more experience you have, the more adaptability you have, and the more time you can invest. You know, maximizing our potential in this life. After retirement, people say, what should I do? <coughs> I'm retired. I have no job, no work to do. All my kids growing up, my grandkids are there. Me, Buddha Buddha, you know, let's just go out sightseeing. Fine, do sightseeing, go, go on a trip, go on a journey. But in that also, spread the message of Islam. Wherever you're going sightseeing, talking to people over there, just conversing, dialogue. And in the dialogue, in the conversation, embedding, inserting little bits and pieces of Islam. This is da'wah. You don't have to go to the pyramids or you don't have to go to the leaning tower of pizza in Italy and say, I want to climb on the top and give da'wah over there. No, you can just be visiting over there in Italy and meeting the tourists and say, oh, you know, talking to them. You know, by the way, in Islam, we do this. Oh, yeah? By the way, our Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, he taught us this. Oh, yeah? Really? Message, knowledge, transfer. That's it. And that is why it needs sabr, patience. A lot of patience. Because when we talk to people, there's a lot of retaliation, response. And, of course, we need haya, morality. And with that, we end this session. Inshallah, after the tea, we'll talk about more detail about the etiquettes and the strategies and the tips. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر لكم والسلام المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه الغفور الرحيم. السلام عليكم. So inshallah, if I request, we can come back to your seat so we can get going since we have a short time now. In this maybe five ten minutes session, we're going to introduce a little bit about ICNA and our activities and the areas that we may need some help also. Since now you are in this workshop and I'm hoping that you're getting motivated to come and work with us. So we'll share some of our activities so that uh, you can see where uh, you, have, you have your interests so you can come and help us, inshallah. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce you to our uh, president, uh, the Ikna Bay Area uh, president, uh, Brother Inayad Razak. So he's the president of the local uh, Ikna Bay Area chapter. So he's, gave you, he's going to give you some overview about the Ikna uh, overall, and then uh, we'll move from there, inshallah. So Brother Inayad Razak. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so I will give you a quick uh, brief introduction of ICNA. ICNA has been around in the Bay Area as an ICNA Bay Area chapter for the last uh, 35 years or more. And uh, right now, uh, this year, ICNA is celebrating its 50th anniversary. ICNA was founded in 1968 in New York. Uh, so ICNA has about 44 chapters and sub-chapters across the, uh, the United States. And we have some of the major chapters are New York, uh, New Jersey, Chicago, Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, Florida, and LA, and San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, So some of the areas that we focus in our, in our Bay Area chapter are the ICNA relief. Uh, you've seen the Mercian wheels uh, that we provide uh, uh, food to the homeless in San Francisco, uh, Oakland, San Jose, Stockton areas. And uh, also the Y-Islam um, that Brother Khaled will talk more about 
In the leaf area, we're also working on the mobile clinic. And uh, inshallah, we're uh, planning to get it ready this year, inshallah. And uh, we also have other programs for YM, Young Muslims. And uh, I'm sure many of you know about the quiz programs that we have annually. Um, so this is just a brief overview. Now I'll give the mic to Brother Khaled, who will give more detail about the Y Islam program in the Bay Area. Jazakallah khair, Brother Inayat. And um, just to let you know that I asked him only for one or two minutes because this program is for Dawa. And if he would talk about Ikna, it's going to take maybe 30 minutes because there are so many different activities in areas other than Dawa. So, but since this is for Dawa and for Y Islam specifically, you can see this table, which is exactly the same table is at the back, uh, at the back of the uh, hall where Brother Abid is sitting. Uh, this is how our uh, booth look like in the different festivals and farmers market and uh, library where we do the dawa. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, this slide is just, uh, I'm gonna just go quickly because this is the departments that we have in our uh, Y Islam, only Y Islam uh, Bay Area. And we divided it into different hierarchies and each of these sub department has a lead. And I'm gonna go over that in the next slide. So for example, we have a sub-department called Dawa Channels. And under that, we have Farmer's Market Dawa, Mall Dawa, uh, which is on hold right now, uh, Fairs and Festivals, Dawa with MSAs, Muslim Student Associations, uh, Street Dawa, and Open Houses. Uh, open Houses is something we started uh, last year uh, and other than that, the, the other bullets that you see, we have been doing this for a few years. Uh, most popular ones that we have is the farmer's market. We have uh, around nine farmer's market around, throughout, throughout the Bay Area. And we set up the table over there, some of them once a month, and some of them each week, every week. Uh, and generally, we have two volunteers in each dawa table. And if we would like to expand that, uh, of course, there are many more farmers market in the Bay Area, then we need more resources and uh, more volunteers. Uh, mall Dawa, we used to do, but then we, because of the lack of the volunteers and uh, lack of the visitation from the visitors also, we stopped doing that. Uh, but we like to go back and do it again if possible. Uh, fairs and festivals generally happens during the summertime. So we have a um, uh, festival like art and wine festival, and uh, Festival of Art, Fremont, Montevideo, Sunnyvale, Palo Alto. These are the three, four, five areas that we have during summertime where we set up our table and these are like a whole day festival, Saturday and Sundays. And we did witness Shahada in those festivals also. So SubhanAllah, I mean, it's an art and wine festival and we did witness Shahada in that art and wine festival. So. <laughs> Yeah, so this is, uh, alhamdulillah, it's a blessing from Allah. So we need help in that area also. And then MSAs generally get materials from us. And we uh, did some uh, events with them. For example, Jesus in Islam was one of the events that we did uh, a couple years back. But we want to go back and do more events with them. And so we need some uh, help in that area also. Open houses is something we started after our first uh, after our uh, workshop that we had with Dr. Seville two years back. And um, we have two type of uh, open houses that we do, lunch with the Muslim, and the uh, other one we call it mini open house. Uh, lunch with the Muslim is something that we send a mass mail to 4,000, 5,000 houses in the vicinity. Uh, so we hire a community center and then we invite people there. So generally, 60 to 80 non-Muslims come to that open house. And we have our own speaker who speak and give presentation about Islam. Then we have uh, interesting Q&A after that, and then a lunch with them. So very good feedback usually we get in those uh, open houses. Um, mini open house is something we just started with the idea that we can have a one-on-one -on -one with the visitors. Because when we have 60, 80 people, 
uh, there's no time to do the one-on-one. -on -one. So that's why uh, we, uh, we started, uh, we, th we thought that how can we do a one-on-one -on -one with the visitors or with the non-Muslims. So we came up with this idea of mini open house, which means that we are going to do it in a small location, like a library or something. And we did it actually in one of the library where 10 people came and it was a presentation along with the Q&A side by side. So it was a very, very powerful open house that we did and there, it was a good feedback that we got from the non-Muslim that came to that open house. So this was about the Dawa channel, Dawa areas. Uh, Ansar is another department that we have and I would uh, like to put Masjid tour in that as well, um, for some reason. Uh, but uh, there are two, two areas under Ansar that uh, we serve. One is the Masjid tour for non-Muslims and new Muslim mentoring. And this mentoring uh, generally happens because we get a call to a 877 Y Islam. Some people take call there and they take Shahada or they already took Shahada, but they call 877 Y Islam, which uh, Imam Jawad Ahmad supervises. He's a supervisor of this hotline. And then uh, the, the, if the request comes from the Bay Area, then we get the uh, notified. We get notified that this request came. Can you go and please help that person? He needs help. He needs mentoring. And um, you know, yeah, you'll be surprised that, uh, well, it's not a surprise, but a lot of mentoring needed from the sister side. There are a lot of sisters that are reverting to Islam. So we need help in this area, especially from the sister side, to work as an Ansar for uh, that new Muslimah. And of course, brothers also, uh, we get the request for brothers, but mostly for sisters. So, so this is the Ansar. And then if we, we also have uh, some programs with the new Muslims, like a new Muslim eat dinner. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we also plan, we actually um, trying to become uh, more, uh, you know, create, trying to create a database with other masajid so that we can have an Ansar lead in different masajid whom we can, you know, when the, uh, let's say if the request come from somebody in uh, San Francisco. So if we have some of our uh, contact over there, then we can ask them for help and, uh, you know, uh, and follow up on that. Follow up is also very important. So we have a setup system set up that we can follow up with them, then make sure that you know, this training or mentoring is on track. Uh, the third one is the inventory. So inventory is uh, the, like the brochures that we have from ICNA, and then Quran translation in Spanish and in English, and some other books. So that's uh, our inventory and we order it. And uh, when we uh, you know, go low in those quantities, um, and we have shahada packages uh, that we order from the national ikna. When the, somebody takes shahada, if you come to know somebody who took shahada, you can contact us and we can give you a package, and that package contains Quran and uh, other brochures, uh, the rug, you know, and then uh, there are four types of shahada packages uh, for brothers and sisters, and for English and Spanish. And we have CDs that we distribute, uh, Islamic books. In the inventory area, uh, we like to expand our um, uh, material. So sometimes we get books and we like to review them. So if you are a good reviewer, we need your help in to review those books so that we can make it uh, uh, part of our inventory and as a proof book that we can distribute. Because some of the books are actually written, but it's not for uh, non-Muslims, it's generally for Muslims. So we like to make sure that the Muslims can understand those books. It'll be easy for them to understand. Training and Terbiya, <clears throat> we have a guideline documents. Uh, if you join our team, we'll give you a guideline document that we use for the newcomers. Uh, Dawa workshop, this is the Dawa workshop that we have and inshallah we'll try to do it more often, uh, not like a two year gap or one year gap, Inshallah, we'll be more often, and we'll work with uh, Imam Jawad also to come here more often and give us more dawah training and workshops. Volunteer tarbiyah, 
so we have a weekly and sometime bi-monthly meetings, YSLA meeting, and during the, those meetings, we ourselves do our own tarbiyah. We have a session for the tafsir or for the hadith or for different uh, presentation that our volunteer give during that meeting, which will be which considered to be a, our own tarbiyah that we conduct. If you like to be part of those meetings, then you can also let us know. Uh, recently, we had soft skill training. Brother uh, Tariq Murad is here. He is the one who gave Discover Islam classes in MCA. And uh, he also conducted that training. It was very good training that we had for uh, eight, eight uh, sessions, or actually 10 sessions. I'm skip some slides here. For media ads, uh, this is something we actually uh, used to have ads. You have seen our ads on the billboards and bus. Uh, we kind of put hole in this one. We haven't been doing it for past maybe a year or a year and a half uh, because we were started concentrating more on the open houses. And we have seen more uh, response from doing open houses because when we send those mass mail which goes to the homes, more people respond compared to seeing a billboard and then responding to us. So that's the reason we not doing it uh, that uh, frequently for past one or two years. Uh, but uh, this is not a bad uh, uh, actually idea to have a billboard because is something that can also attract people to come and and uh, you know call us call. You know, pick up the phone and call the hotline number. Uh, the only thing is, it's a little bit more costly, so that's uh, one of the negative. Uh, but if there's a national campaign going on, then it becomes a little bit cheaper. So we could even consider that in the future. So for future expansion that we are planning to do, if we get more volunteers, more resources, that we like to expand more farmers market in the area, do more steer dawa, uh, more library dawa, mall dawa, uh, tarbiya for the volunteers. If you are a knowledgeable person, you have a, you have a, um, you know, some, uh, you have to taken a course and know more about Quran and tafsir and you'd like to contribute that, you can also, you know, be part of our team. A lot of help we need with the follow-ups. Follow-ups is the area that we a little bit lack because uh, when non-Muslim contact us or leave their contact, uh, we, uh, we need to follow up with them. We need to bring them, you know, tell them our uh, future events and all that. Generally, we get their email and we send them as a database, but uh, we like people to call them, you know, and find out uh, you know, how are you doing, Would you, you know, if they need any help or any uh, question they may have. So, so we need some help in the follow-up uh, area also. And as I said, in Ansar for rewards, we need help for mentoring the rewards. And uh, for the marketing purposes, social media, Facebook, Twitter, if you are good at that, uh, you can also help. Uh, website, so we have uh, iknabayarea.org website. Um, so we need to you know improve our content add more content if you are familiar with the website development you can also join the team and we'd like to do more events with msas uh, and there are many msas in this uh, area there are many colleges and universities that like to work with as i said we generally give them our materials uh, but that's mostly it but we want to get more involved with them so in the back, you have a table there, and we have a, a sign-up sheet. If you like to volunteer with us, you can write your name. Each sheet has actually um, four entries. So uh, one sheet is not for one person. Actually, four person can enter information in, in the one sheet there. And each of those has an in area of interest. So you can look at it and see the boxes and see which area you think you can help. If you think you can help in certain areas, which I just went over it, uh, you can check market and inshallah we'll contact you 
We'll put you in our database. Uh, you can start joining our meetings. As I said, you know, our meetings are actually very informative. We do tarbiya during, the, during those meetings. We do some admin work, meaning whatever project and uh, the, the programs coming up, we're planning and every, everything, you know, like part of that meeting. So if you want to be uh, part of those meetings, uh, welcome to, you know, contact us and then we'll uh, add you in that. In, so these are the contacts. I just want to go of the four main items that I have here. 877 Y Islam is a national hotline. If you see a friend or somebody who, um, you know, if you see a friend, you can talk to them about Islam. But if you like to tell them about our number that they can, you know, maybe tell to their friends, 877 Y Islam is the number anybody can call to have information about Islam. So this is the national hotline. And this is, as I mentioned, supervised by Imam Jawad Ahmad. And yislam at iknaberia.org is an email. You can give it to your colleague if they have any, or you know, uh, any friend or anybody who wants to know about Islam, who have any question about Islam, any request about the material. So any external requests that come to us, we like to, these to be sent to yislam at iknaberia.org. So just memorize it, yislam at iknaberia.org. This is for the external requests. If you need any info, then info at iknaberia.org is for the getting the information. And finally, the www.iknaberia.org is our local website. So with that, I conclude here. And as I mentioned, uh, if you'd like to volunteer with us, you can go back, you know, grab that uh, for the, the page which has the, the entry. You can put your name and the area of interest, and you can check mark that. We will contact you after this uh, workshop, and inshallah, we'll add you to our database and our team, and then you can, inshallah, do this beautiful work of da'wah with us. Okay, jazakallah khair. So with that, I'll give the mic back to Imam Jawad Ahmed. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu salam wa kareem, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sunnah bi sunnah bi deen, amma ba'd. So we continue from where we left off uh, last time, which is about the prerequisites that we had talked about in terms of uh, that is required. This session will talk about certain specific etiquettes of da'wah that we need to uh, you know, think about and uh, have a constructive dialogue discussion in such a manner to bring the person towards Allah SWT. So a few things that we'll be going over now is, uh, of course, the prerequisites we'll talk about, then knowing your audience, because half the game is all about knowing your audience. Because if, if we just keep talking, and that talk is not penetrating your audience, it is not permeating through their mindset, their heart, then it will not go anywhere. It is just like talking to a wall. And that is why we need to know how to engage the audience in that uh, talk of da'wah whether it is at a dawah booth, at a dawah festival, or it could be on a phone, it could be through email, it could be on a plane, on a train, on a bus ride, wherever you are interacting with someone, you know the audience and you know how to engage with them, and what proactive dawah strategies can you use on the spur of the moment. That is very essential. Because dawah is all about dialogue, conversation. And what does conversation comprise of? Hello, anybody home? What does conversation comprise of? Yeah, interaction, two people, what else? What's the ingredient, you know, the main ingredient? You just had the chai, the spicy masala chai, you know, what was there? There was tea, there was sugar, there was milk, ingredient. What's the ingredient for a conversation? Hmm? Sorry? Interest, topic, yeah, these are all byproducts. What's the main thing? Words, thank you, somebody, alhamdulillah, welcome home, words, we need to have the right words, the right word choices, we need to know when to use, which word, where to use, how to use, to whom to use, you may say the right word but to a wrong person, you may say a wrong word but to the right person, <laughs> it could happen, so words are very important, 
the word choices that we make in our conversation, the sentences that are constructed by your tongue. Before that, you have to deliberate, you have to contemplate in the brain, what is my next word going to be? What is my next sentence going to be? What is my next point going to be to this person that I'm talking? Because if you have gaps and pauses in your conversation, you lost it. Continuous talk is a big challenge. Continuously talking. And I tell this to our hotline associates, you know, because on the phone, if you pause, you've given the ball to the other person, to the other team, the opposition. Now they'll take that pause, they'll start rambling on, they'll start talking and talking, and you lost the, you lost the steering wheel, you lost the power, the control. That is why it's very important that when you are talking, you're talking continuously in the free flow where the ideas are emanating in from the brain and the heart and your words are constructing and they're flowing through to your tongue so that you don't have a pause. A big, big prize coveted thing is you talk continuously for 15 minutes straight. 15 minutes, continuously you talk. That's a big thing. Because for 15 minutes, somebody is silent and listening to you. And imagine all those words entering their ear and their brain and then their heart. It's making an impact and making an influence. And that is why it's very important. So let's move forward, inshallah. Like I said, yes. Okay, we'll take it up in the question and answer session. We're going to have a Q&A, so we'll talk about it over there. So like we said, ilm, knowledge is important. We talked about that before the tea break. You know, kindness and gentleness, what does that mean? The Arabic word is for it, li. And where do we get this word? It's in the Quran. You can op look it up. Open up Surah Al Imran, Surah 3. Verses, I believe, 130, 135, 134 in that area. In Surah Al Imran, Allah SWT says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَإِن فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ Allah is saying, it is from the Rahmah of Allah. Allah. It is purely and purely from the mercy of Allah. What? What is from mercy of Allah? فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ You, O Muhammad Sallallahu you, O Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Alayhi Salaatu Salaam, you were lenient to them, kind to them, gentle to them. This is Allah telling us in Surah Al-Imran. It is the Rahmah of Allah. So we need to beg Allah for Rahmah. We need to beg Allah, plead Allah that, Oh Allah, make my heart soft. Make my heart and tongue soft for this da'wah, for this message. Like you did for Muhammad فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ Because Allah says, If this did not happen, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ And if you were, O Muhammad Sallam, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ إِشْ What? Fadlan, ghaliz al qalb. If you were rigid, stiff hearted, ghaliz al qalb meaning very rigid, very timid, very stiff hearted. If you were like that, O Muhammad, what would happen? La in fadlu min hawli. They will run away from you. Like you all right now, run away from this hall. If I was so bad, alhamdulillah, I tried not to be that bad. So at least you're sitting. So that's what Allah is saying. That if we want to give da'wah, we want to give message, we need to ask Allah to melt our hearts, to soften our hearts. A stiff-hearted, rigid person cannot give da'wah. Because they'll get restless quickly. They'll become impatient quickly. Muttarib, you know. Very quickly they'll get agitated, irritated, and start shouting and cursing. And yes, then people say, well, then I can't give da'wah. I'm a very short-tempered person. I get angry very fast. No. Everybody can give da'wah because the ayah is saying, you ask Allah, you beg Allah to tone you down, to calm you down, to give you the sifa, give you the etiquettes. And that is what Allah's mother is saying, that if Rasulullah was like that, they would have run away from it. But they all cling to him. Rasulullah was like a magnet. He attracted people. He magnetized people. He mobilized people. Meaning, the message in this is, if we really want to be a good da'i, our character, our personality, our akhlaq, our behavior should be such that we attract non-Muslims. We are so compassionate, we are so friendly, so loving and kind that everybody likes to hang around with us. People in Mecca and Medina wanted to hang around with the Prophet and be with him and listen to him. And that is how they got 
transformed and changed. So we need to make our personality as a da'i or da'iya that attracts people. You know, right starting, right starting from the facial expressions that we make when we're talking to a non-Muslim. The body language that we adapt when we're talking to a non-Muslim. And the whole nine yards from that. And then of course, wisdom, knowing the audience, knowing their background, knowing their culture, knowing their values, knowing their concerns. Dawah is all about similarity. I know a lot of people start off with Dawah. When they start off with Dawah, they talk about comparison. In Christianity this, in Islam this. In Judaism this, in Islam this. In Hinduism this, in Islam this. Differences tear us apart. Am I right or wrong? You talk to somebody, you are different, I am different. How are you going to bring them close to you? Yes, there are differences. There is no denying of that. But let's not focus on that. If it comes in the conversation, if it comes in the dialogue, so be it, we'll talk about it. But that should not be the initial part. The starting point should be, like I said last night, the ayah from Surah Al-Imran, the starting point should be what? Similarities. قُلْ تَعَالُوا إِلَىٰ قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالُوا إِلَىٰ كَلَمَةٍ سَوَاءٌ بَيْنَنَّا وَبَيْنَكُمْ O people of the book, say, O people of the book, come to a word that is similar to us and you. أَلَّا نَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا الله. That we don't worship except Allah. One Allah, one God, one similarity. But we get so many calls on the hotline from Christians and they say, Oh really? You Muslims also do? Oh really? In Islam this is all? Yeah. A lot of things in, you know, being good to parents. Isn't that part of Islam? That's part of Jesus' teaching also. That's what the Christians, do you see any Christian saying, you got to ridicule your parents, you got to humiliate your parents, you got to insult your parents? Does any Christian do that? Do the church service on Sunday, the pastor say that? So let's talk about respect for parents. Let's talk about similarities. Being kind to your neighbor. Every Sunday the pastor from the pulpit is talking about being kind and generous to your neighbor. Being good to your neighbor. Does that ring a bell for Muslims? Does that ring a bell? Who told us to be kind to our neighbors? There was something in the chai that made you mute, silent. I'm asking a question. You know, let's make it a two-way dialogue. This is a workshop. So let's make, I know you don't want to talk that much, but this is about dialogue, conversation, two-way. Who told us to be kind to our neighbors? Muhammad. Muhammad. You see the connection? Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Jesus, brothers. Prophets are brothers. Source of knowledge, same. Allah, divine, wahi. So all are same. And that is why this is what we need to know about wisdom, hikmah, and then sabr. We have to have like the sabr of the prophets, anbiya. Look how much patience they went through, how much struggle they went through, how much differences. And of course, last but not the least, and the most important, haya. Haya, modesty. What does that mean? Haya, modesty, it's time to get up. Uh, haya, modesty, I have to show you physically. This is the personification. Right? I am walking. You are observing me. You're watching me. What am I doing right now? Well, not running, but in a hurry. What am I doing now? Yeah, I was in a hurry back then. What am I doing now? How are you getting these words? Am I saying anything to you? You're wrong. I am. Body language. Haya is really your body language, your akhlaq, your character. Right starting from the dress you wear, the facial expression you have, the way you move, the way you walk, the way you talk, everything. They're watching, they're observing, they're looking. So a da'i or da'iya has a very high and important role to play in terms of akhlaq, haya, morality. How can we give da'wah and our morality is bad? Our akhlaq is bad. If I am taunting and teasing, if I'm talking in a very high voice, oh, you have to tell about Islam, Islam is about Muhammad, Muhammad is talking about Islam. Are you going to listen to me? You're going to say, brother, shut up. Okay, sorry. Excuse me. So, haya, how does haya play a role in being a da'i? Because that is the silent message wives you're saying. Like you said, I was walking in a hurry. I didn't tell you I'm in a hurry. You just observed me. And you calculated, your brain calculated that action and transformed into words. I was strolling, taking all my time. I didn't tell you that. You observe. 
So people who are not Muslims, they are observing us. Where are they observing us? Do they come to our bedroom? How many non-Muslims came to your bedroom, sir? No. How many non-Muslims came to your house, sir? How many non-Muslims came to you? Five. At least, so you are better than the rest of us. All right? I had two, so you have five. You beat me. <laughs> so, people don't come to your house to observe you. Where do, you, where do they observe you? Public. 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 Society. The moment you step out of the house, you are being watched. Yes, Uncle Sam is watching. But a million other people are watching too. So it is very important for the da'i and da'iya to improve and enhance their character. And for that I would like to mention kudos to whoever gave me this message. I got this message from somewhere in the audience. In our community we need Quranic tafsir classes for brothers and for our youth. Ikna should work with MCA to start regular tafsir classes. Jazakallah khair. I agree with that. I second that. Because we need to have regular classes of Qur'an and tafsir so that we understand the Qur'anic akhlaq, Qur'anic adab, and right, usloop. This is very important for da'wah, for da'i. Da'wah is not something abstract. Da'wah is not something theoretical. That you just do a workshop, you do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, boom, done. Alright, let's go, on the street, da'wah. No, da'wah is an all-round comprehensive building system. You need to constantly enhance your character, your akhlaq. And how would you do that? Through Qur'an. When you have tafsir classes, when you have regular classes in a hall like this, people sitting and a sheikh or someone talking, you are building your personality, you're building your akhlaq. Your akhlaq will change people's heart. Your akhlaq will change people's mind. And that is why it is very important to have a continuous classes basis. So that a person can understand. Remember, when the Sahaba came to Ummul Mu'mineen, Aisha Siddiq Anha, they came to her and they said, uh, Akhbirni, you know, Akhbirna, tell us about the character of uh, Rasulullah. She did not give a whole big sermon, a big talk, a big lecture. She sufficed with just two words. Two words is the answer for a, big, for a question. What were those two words? خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ You want to know about the uh, akhlaq of Rasulullah? خُلُقُهُ His character is Al-Qur'an. What do these two words mean? خُلُقُهُ Quran. It means that his character is the Qur'an. You open the Qur'an, you read the Qur'an, you find in his character. You open the Qur'an, you read an ayah, you find in his behavior, in his personality. You see that he is a living, walking, mobile Qur'an. Wherever Rasulullah is going, you are seeing a tafsir of the Qur'an in his character. And we being the followers, the ummati of Muhammad Sallam, we being that, we have to adopt that, adapt that, and follow that. Is that clear so far? Yes. Let's move on to the next thing. So how do you know your audience? When you met the first, when you went to your job, your workplace, the first day you went, what did you do? Tell me. First day on your job, new company, new place, new office, new people. What's the first thing you did with them? You introduced yourself, right? Is that all you did? Or did you do also to ask them for their introduction? Right. When you did that, how did you feel? Emotionally, psychologically, how did you feel in your heart? How did you feel after doing that? Huh? Good? Did anybody feel bad? Did anybody, did anybody feel like vomiting? Oh, oh, that. Keep your introduction. Don't, don't you ever please tell me about that. You feel good. Dawah is all about conversation, dialogue, two-way. You introduce yourself. Who am I? Where am I from? I got a wife and some kids and second one looking for it. No problem. Don't tell that to my first wife, by the way. All right? Oh, no. We can't say that in America, right? That's off limits. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, you feel good when you talk to people. If you remain aloof, you know aloof? Oh, I don't want to talk to anybody. I just come here, my job, 9 to 5, pick my bag, I'm out of here. If you do that, you become isolated. Heck, man, wisdom is all about knowing your audience. You've been in this country for 30, 40, 50 years. Or you were born and raised in this country. You know in and out. Everything is on your fingertip about America, American culture, American values, American 
you know, traditions and whatever. Use that to insert Islam. Let me ask you a simple question. Imagine you were watching the fireworks, 4th of July fireworks. And if somebody is standing next to you and you had to strike your conversation, what would you say? What would you do? Just spurt out of the moment. Huh? Yes, aren't that, isn't that so beautiful? Oh yeah, I come here every year to watch it at the Fisherman's Wharf. My kids and I have been coming here for about the last 15 years. Oh yeah, really? We love it too. And it's good. Islam, Islam allows us for enjoyment, entertainment. Islam is not dull and boring. Islam is not submissive. Islam is not about just being hush and everything. Is it haram to watch fireworks, ya sheikh? No. Yes. We got a sheikh in the house, mashallah. You know, they say everyone is a mufti when they are with 50. Everyone is a mufti when they are 50, right? Once you reach age 50, don't raise your hand. I don't need to know your ages. Once you reach 50, you start giving fatwa. Brother, that's haram. Brother, you can't pray with that. Brother, you can't have that. Sister, that's haram. Sister, that's makru. Because by 50, you have so much wisdom, hikmah, that you feel like, hey, I can give fatwas. You know, I don't need a sheikh to come and tell me certification. I'm a 50 with the mufti, right? So that's why it's very important to understand analogy as a tool. Like I gave the example, fireworks, simple thing. Instead of me standing there for half an hour waiting for the fireworks, I can strike a conversation right and left with somebody. They're so beautiful. Oh, yeah. Huh? Advantage. advantage. Instead of like, share, comment, like, share. Did it start yet? No. Like, share, comment. This is what we're doing. You go everywhere. You go everywhere today. Restaurants, parks, <laughs> anywhere. You see people at a restaurant, four people sitting on the table. Everybody, <laughs> why did you come here? Oh, we came to eat together. What? Eat together? But are you eating in the phone? No, we're waiting for the order. We order, we're waiting just for it to come. In San, we are so technologically addicted, the moment we find smallest time, instead of talking to human beings, salam alaikum, brother, how are you? Okay, you're a doctor, I'm a patient, can you see me? <laughs> instead of doing that, <laughs> instead of doing that, he opens his phone, I open my phone, we might be even liking the same page that we'll, he's liking. Hey, why did you like that page? How do you know? I just saw that. Well, you could have asked me. I'm sitting right across the table. <laughs> so that's why it's very important to use analogy, similes, parables to strike conversation. Yes, I know we, the last night a brother asked, what if you are shy? You're embarrassed to talk. What do you do? Well, you can build your courage. You can build your confidence by short baby steps. Like one time, one incident, you just said a something, one simple thing, and nothing happened, that builds your confidence. Next time you are at a public location, you'll remember your last event, and you say, hey, at that time, I said something, reaction was good, positive, let me speak a bit more today. And so on and so forth, you start building your courage, your confidence to speak to strangers. And there's nothing wrong, haram, about talking to a non-mahram if you're talking about Islam. I know a lot of people bring fatwas, brother, how can you talk to that lady over there? She's non-mahram. She is not your, uh, you know, she's wearing a skirt. Well, I'm not looking at her skirt. I'm not even looking at her face. I'm looking at something beyond that. She is a woman of Jannah. And that's where my vision is. I'm only talking to her for the sake of da'wah and Islam. And that's it. I'm not talking to her about her personal life. I'm not talking to her to socialize with her. I'm only delivering the message. And the moment the message is stopped, I turn away and move on. There's nothing haram about it. There's nothing wrong about it. Yes, it is not the most pleasing thing. But if the situation requires that I have to talk about Islam to a non-mahram or likewise for a sister, if she has to talk, a lot of times we get sisters, especially Ikna sisters calling on the Y Islam hotline, asking, brother, is it okay to talk to a non-mahram? Is it okay to talk to a male about Islam? I say, yes, only for the purpose of Islam, for da'wah. One inch, no more. No more than one inch. Because the moment the conversation changes from da'wah to something personal, something social, you stop. Now the fatwa comes in. It kicks in. It's haram. You're not supposed to talk about personal life and personal things with a non-mahram. But Islam, Muhammad Wasallam, Quran, Allah, yes. Because you are spreading the message. You're letting the people know. At that moment, at that situation, at that circumstance, you are the only one there. So you have to deliver the message. One thing that is very important is very to say is driving the conversation. A lot of times when we are talking to people, we 
just answer the question. Somebody asked us, uh, why do you wear this? Well, I wear this to cover my hair and to cover my head when I'm praying. Um, it is better, it is more pleasing and more loving to God. Appreciate it, that's why I'm doing it. Any other question? Yeah, why do you wear these glasses? Oh, because I don't see clearly, I don't have vision, that's why I wear these glasses. Next, anything more? What am I doing? Am I doing dawah? Some might say, yeah, because you're answering questions. But this is not dawah. You're just answering, then yes. Hadir, now. Next, hadir, next. This is not dawah. Dawah is, they ask you a question, why you wear this? Boom, you got an opportunity. You're going to use this question and this answer to relate to things that will drive the conversation further. You can relate so many things. Can somebody from the audience give me an example? What would you use this kufi, this topi or kufi or hat? as an opportunity to relate to some concept of Islam. Anything, yeah? something else which I thought is really interesting. Okay, I'll come to that. Let me just get this one. It's this? With this? We'll come to you. We'll come to you. I just, for this moment, I just want to see how we are thinking. Yes, sister? Prayer, all right. Ibadah, worship, prayer, five times a day. What else would you connect it with? Modesty. Modesty, very good. Yes, sister? Same thing. Modesty in dress code, right? Attire. What are you conscious of God watching you? Spirituality, right? Conscious of God ob watching me, observing me. Yes, sister? Visibility. Visibility. Very good. I'm visible. If I wear this and I go and I go into a mall, I'll raise some eyebrows, right? Mm, oh. And I really salute all the sisters, you know? All the sisters wearing hijab and they're going out in public, they're very courageous, very self-confident, very dashing and bold personality because they're taking the courage out home, outside the home. And they're attracting attention, attracting. Because people are watching and looking and they're making all kinds of imaginations in their mind, all kinds of concepts. And the sisters not shying away from it, feeling embarrassed. And that is why I say that brothers, we need to say a big takbir for the sisters. Takbir. No, you can do better than that. One more time. Takbir. That's better. Because we, we also have attire, but sometimes we choose not to wear it, feeling shy and embarrassed. Now we come to your question, sister. Uh, I, just, I just thought it was really interesting because I just wanted to share something. Yes, go ahead. I have two friends from two different you know, uh, continents. All right. Yeah, psychics and fortune yeah. tellers. Yeah, and it's really it's a dark side. But right. I never knew anything much about it. Okay. And because of these two friends, I wanted to know what Islam was saying about it, right? Because somehow I knew that it's not going to go well for them, mm -hmm. and they're going to be asking questions. And it's exactly what happened during Ramadan. I started learning about it. Okay. And then after Ramadan, both of them, Subhanallah, when I was in Europe and when I came here, they both wanted to know the you know what I. Right. So I told them then, I uh -huh. said, well, if you want my opinion, it's not going to be my opinion, but I'm going to tell you from the point, from a Muslim perspective, right. what Islam says about all of that. Right. And I need you to be open for it and, you know, to kind of like be open-minded and heart mm -hmm. you know? Right. And then listen, and that's kind of like a way for me to go like into Islam and then, and then suddenly they ask for a copy of the Quran. Subhanallah. It's, it's amazing. Amazing. I mean, something you don't think of. But exactly. Right. Um, good at it. Right. So use that. Right. You know? Right. And it was the same thing about like one of them is gay, and then she was like, because she knew I didn't like the fact that she was gay. So right. I to class, and okay, I'm gonna tell you again. Okay. Because I'm respected. Right. It's my opinion that I don't like to be gay because I know your history. Right. However, this is what Islam says about being gay. Right. You know what I mean, so at the end of the day, right. I asked them, you know, do you believe in a God? Do you believe in all right. that? Subhanallah. Amazing. Yeah, it was really amazing. Allah has His ways. God has His ways of using us and using our strategies. You know, this is what your story, your sister, reminds me of uh, one of the one of the attributes of Allah. One of the attributes sif of Allah is musabbibul asbab. You know, musabbibul asbab. Asbab means asbab means vehicle, means mechanisms. 
Allah is the musabbibul asbab. Allah is the creator of the means. He is the initiator of the means. The means will come their way. You just have a desire. Like this morning, I was having breakfast with the Ikna brothers. One of them mentioned something about coming to America. And subhanAllah, in his story, I saw the same thing. Allah made a means. Allah chose someone else to help and assist him to get a visa to come to this country. But he or any one of us would have never thought in our wildest dream that would happen. But Allah made it happen. Because Allah is what? Musabbibul asbab. That is why a lot of times we want to accomplish something. A lot of times we want to achieve something. But we don't have the means. Or sometimes we exhaust all the means and still we don't accomplish something. Can I say something? Yes. Uh, as you compare to that, uh, one brother uh, just uh, last week, he, he stand with me, he said, uh, Sheikh Rahman, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm, I'm out of job right now. And every time I apply, uh, there is no way. Uh, there is any way can can I change my situation to find a job? I said to him, mm. uh, in my experience, you have to for one week, mm -hmm. one hour before Fajr, mm -hmm. uh, walk up and pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right, and right. Flee to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yes. And focus on only one dua, asking for a job. Mm. And he started like just uh, two, three days, and I met him yesterday. Subhanallah. He helped me. And he Subhanallah. Said, and he gave me a right description. And this, this, but this is related to. Musabbi wal asbah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. What a beautiful story. You know, sometimes that's why there's a hadith of Rasulullah. He said, Ad-Deenu Nasiha. Deenu Nasiha. Very famous hadith. Ad-Deenu Nasiha. Deen, religion, is all about advice. Sincerity of advice. Ikhlas, khulus, sincerity. When somebody comes up to you and asks you a question of their situation, their predicament, what should I do in this? The advice that you give at that time is part of deen, part of iman, i'tiqad, belief. And the advice that you give at that time is an amana, a trust. If you give a good advice and he or she acts upon it, you get sadaqa jariya. Wallah, I believe you, brother. You will be getting sadaqa jariya for this brother who got a job. And however he works, Allah will inshallah put in mizan of hasanat. And we all say ameen. Ameen for that. Because this is an amana, a trust. You know, Rasul said, give sadaqa. One of the sadaqa that you can give is a good advice to your brother and sister in Islam. Advice. And what are we giving advice in da'wah? We're giving advice to non-Muslim. But they are our brother and sister in humanity. Hum ukhuwa fil makhluk. Right? Even if they are not from Islam, they're not part of Islam or Muslim, but they are our brother and sister from Bani Adam. Their father and mother was Adam and Hawa, like our father and mother. So we should look at non-Muslims as our brother and sister. I said this at a masjid one time, and somebody got up from, Brother, how can you say that? They are kafir, they are non-Muslim. They don't, calm down, calm down, take it easy. Before the cops come and take you away, take it easy. Why? This Hamasa, you know, in Arabic, Hamasa, why this, you know, in, there's no word to translate this Hamasa, you know, this uh, aggression that, oh, they are different, we are different. They are, we are same. Kulluna min Adam, wa Adam min Turab, wa nahnu min at Turab. We are all from Adam al Islam, and Adam was from dust, from sand, from Turab, and we are not from metal, from Hadith, we are also from Turab. Let's look at it with Rahmah, with compassion, right? With Tamanina uh, that they are our brother and sister in humanity. And inshallah, they'll become our brother and sister in Islam. Opportunity. Opportunity. Exactly. Let's move on to the next one. Like the sister said, opportunity. How do you find an opportunity in every person for da'wah? Somebody, you can meet somebody probably in a grocery store line. You know, you're standing in the line, they have to pay for their groceries, you have to pay. Or you're at Walmart maybe, you're trying to pay for your thing there. While you're standing, both of you are standing, both of you have time. Oh, I see a lot of load of stuff over there. Yeah. How come you have very, oh, I only got one kid. You know, conversation, opportunity. While I'm standing here, instead of just standing there gazing around the whole store, which I've done already a hundred times before, because I come to the same Walmart every single time, let me strike an opportunity. Let me talk to the person behind me or in front of me. 
And, you know, a lot of times we have jitters, nervous. If I start a conversation, are they going to slap me? No, believe me. I've done that 99, 100 times, 99 times, I didn't get a slap. What happened that one time, brother? Oh, she said a very racial slur. You Arab with a do-rag eating chicken wrap, go back to your country. <laughs> this is exactly what she said. I'm not making it up. Wallahi, I, it's not fiction. She said, you Arab with a do-rag, because I was with do-rag, eating a chicken wrap, because I see you all eat, going to falafel store and shawarma store eating chicken wraps. Go back to your country. Huh? That was exactly my question. How long was she thinking about saying that to me? When I was just trying to strike a conversation at the Walmart store with her, I said, like, okay, okay, I'll go back to my country. And then she didn't stop. She went on and saying, and, all right, I, okay. I rest my case. Yes, that was only one time. But the 99 times, people had a conversation. And that conversation was really da'wah. Because they did not talk about Allah, Quran, Muhammad, Akhirah, but they talked about something that is part of their life. Part, people share their stories even in a, in a chain store or line somewhere. People share about their worries, their humum. You know, humum concerns. What concerns them? Let's talk about humum. Quran is a book of Allah that removes the humum. Quran removes your anxiety, your concern. So talk about that. He said, oh, by the way, you know, in our holy book, the Quran, which was the last revelation given to Muhammad, our prophet messenger, it says about your situation, it's true. Oh, yeah? Really? You got a book that talks about that? Where can I get it? At MCA or Ikna Bay Area chapter. Just a small word, a small sentence instigated someone to ask for a Quran. Where can I get it? And probably 50 years in her life or his life, they never thought about getting a Qur'an. But just because you were the musabib, you were the sabab, and Allah was the musabib al-asbab, He gave you, He put you at the right place at the right time to be an ambassador of Islam and to use your words, your tongue, to deliver the message. See, we are just robots, so to speak. Not literally, but so to speak. We are robots. We are delivering the message of the divine. Because now there's no more Nabi to come, right? There's no more Rasul is going to come. So we have to do this job. And that is why it's very important that instead of just asking questions, I mean, instead of just answering questions, we need to ask questions to provoke and incite them, interest into Islam. What interests they, they may have, what things. This is the way you need to engage the call. The call, I mean, the person. When you're calling the person, whether on phone or in person, you are calling the person toward Islam. You need to engage with them and bring the golden rule in. The golden rule is don't just answer the question and stop. This is the golden rule of da'wah. Never do this. A lot of times we are just so nervous and shy and embarrassed that somebody asks a question, we just answer and then we stop, silent. Now unless the person will ask another question, we will not talk to them. Opposite. What we need to do is the question that they ask, we, we embed in our answer the strategies of da'wah so that they can relate to those things. Very important that they can understand that the question that they ask is now connected to a whole line of ideas and concepts. How do we do that? A lot of times people say, you know, I don't know what to talk about Islam. How? How should I engage the caller? Ask open-ended questions. You know open-ended questions? They're questions where somebody's going to give you a long answer. <laughs> Instead of saying, you know, uh, did you do this? Are you this? And they just say yes, no, yes, no. Instead of asking just a yes, no question, that's not going to get you anywhere. You have to ask an open-ended question. Something, you know, that can bring about in their mind ideas and thoughts that will strike the conversation between you and them. This is the Dawa strategy 101. The basics, the fundamentals. When we are engaging anybody, whether you do it on the phone to a caller or whether you do it in person to, you know, face to face. You have to ask open-ended questions. What are your views about so-and-so, such-and-such? And they'll, they'll start talking about it. Then you can insert your views which are coming from Islam, from Quran. Oh, by the way, we believe or we see. Who is this we? Oh, Muslims. Where do you get it from? Quran. What is Quran? Word of Allah. Who is Allah? God. 
Who is God? Creator. You see how the whole connection built up? From one small thing. And that is what we need to do. That these open-ended questions always bring about a change in the person. I've given an example to you. One of the basic open-ended questions is, what do you know about Islam? <laughs> I asked this one question to a, a person in a park because my kid was playing, they hit the ball, the ball went over there, they picked it up. I said, oh, thank you so much, you know, you have a, have a good day. Are you Muslim? I said, yeah, I am. Before he would ask another question, I said, what do you know about Islam? Oh, all I know about Islam, you make great food. That falafel, shawarma, the gyro, man, that's awesome. You know, if I would be a Muslim for a day, I'll just eat enough chicken, you know, shawarmas all day. This is a real, I'm not making, this is a real thing. In a park where people are praying, playing, and my son just kicked the ball, he went there, the guy just sees me, he said, are you a Muslim yet? I said, what do you know about Islam? Food. If food is something that attracts someone to Islam, talk about food. Oh, you know, by the way, we have baklava, we have makluba, we have mansaf. You move a little bit more in the Muslim culture, you go to biryani, you go to halim, nihari, paya. You move a little bit more, you go to fish, you know, machi, you know, from Bangladesh. Move a bit more south, Sri Lanka. Talk about some other food, ethnic foods. If food is what really concerns and attracts someone to Islam, talk about a different food. And culture and using that you bring about the talk to Islam oh by the way our Lord our Creator our God Allah said we should not waste food oh yeah you know what that's right I hate people wasting food I see that on the church ministry videos people in Africa dying because of see they're talking now they're talking we are rolling now food from food we started off now we're talking about wasting food and who is stopping us from wasting food? Allah. Why? Because Allah is the one who gave us food in the first place. And you can even throw in one ayah over there. Kulu washrabu. You know? Kulu washrabu haniyam maria. Eat and drink. You know? This ayah is about Jannah. Allah is talking about. You can tell that. Then look, our Lord Allah says that in Jannah we can eat and drink and have a nice time. Wala tusrifu. And don't spend, you know, waste anything. So there are many ways to go on to do that in terms of engaging the person. Here are some examples of open-ended questions that you can you know, store in your you know, dictionary or in your database that you can use. Of course, there's no end to it. You can have a whole hundred different open-ended questions. I'm just giving some examples that I have tried and they have worked miracles and wonders in conversation, in da'wah. For example, you know, what, one of the most basic and prominent question, purpose of life. What do you think is the purpose of life? Why are we here? What are we here for? You know, do you follow a faith? Yes, why? Well, then they'll tell you why they follow that faith. You know, Scientology, have you heard of Scientology? We, on a phone call on Hotline, we bumped into one person who is a person who follows Scientology. Well, why do you follow Scientology? And they would go on to explain about the whole, you know, manifesto and vendetta of Scientology. And you can, you can relate to that. You can, you know, connect with that. Look. Scientology is not an ideology. It's not an aqidah. Quran talks about science. Allah has talked about it, science in the Quran 1400 years ago when nobody had anything about it. You can use that as a connection, as a bridge, and then start a dialogue and da'wah about the ayats in the Quran about science, which is such as Allah says in the Quran, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, I forget the Arabic, but the transition is we made every living thing. From water. <laughs> right. Allah says hay, living. Allah is saying, Allah the Khalik, the master, the creator is saying, we made every living thing from water. This guy is so much into science, you say, look, water is life. Why is NASA searching for water on Mars? Because if water is there on Mars, there must be life. If there's no water, means there's no life. Even the amoeba has water inside it, the smallest thing creature. So this is science we're talking about. And science is a means, a tool to get closer to Allah, not far away from Allah. Alaysa Ghazalik, you know, science should be a means to get closer to Allah, to recognize Allah, to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so on. You can also talk about believing a creator of a universe, you know. How, have you ever experienced spirituality? America. America is depressed. America is seriously depressed. I'm not saying this. 
Uncle Google is, you know, right here close by. Uncle Google lives here, your headquarters. I just did a Google search, depression in America. Just type these words, depression in America. You'll see all the websites with all the statistics. What percentage of Americans are depressed in America? How many Americans are considering suicide? How many Americans have committed suicide in the last year, in the last decade? There are so many statistics. When you look at all those websites and all those statistics, you come to a conclusion, America is depressed. And the medicine and the cure for depression is with who? Islam. Quran. Quran. Allah. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ First ayah. Second ayah. You can go on to say that Allah tells us that He will test us. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوِي وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Allah says we will definitely test you with reduction, with loss of life and reduction in money and wealth and children and give the glad tidings to the patient ones. So with depression, with anxiety, there are so many conversations. We have had so many people on the Y Slam hotline calling and saying, I am just depressed. I need someone to talk to. And I had no other number to call. I was just searching and somehow I came to your website, yislam.org. And you had this number, 877 Slam. So I'm calling. Two in the morning, one in the morning, they're calling. They're depressed. They're, not, they're sleepless. They took the medicine, took the Valium, took the Xynex, took the Prozac, whatever medicine. It's not bringing them sleep. So they pick up the phone. Boom. Opportunity. Talk. Why are you depressed? What's the reason of depression? What's the cause of depression? Let me talk to you about God. Let me talk to you about spirituality. Do you meditate? Do you have meditation? No, nothing. We have a lot of meditation. We meditate five times a day. Five times a day we kneel down on the ground. We put our forehead on the ground. You know, me and you, we pray five times a day so we take it for granted. Doctors, physicians, and I know physician is sitting here. Physicians have testified, witnessed, that when you put the forehead, the frontal lobe of the brain, when it goes down on the ground, it helps circulating your blood flow in the body, in the brain so much, it tranquilizes you. I just read this on a medical journal, a web, medical website. We are so lucky. We are so, so lucky thanks to Allah who has ordained for us to five time daily prayers that we put our head on the ground and we are getting re-energized. We're getting this calmness. Ask the people who don't put their head on the ground. And by the way, Jesus, Isa Islam also prayed like us. He kneeled down on the ground and he put his head on the ground. As much as the benefits of Salah are, in terms of spiritually, medically this is the benefit of Salah, putting the forehead. So imagine somebody who never prayed in their life, a non-Muslim, 40, 50, 60 years of life. They never prayed, they never put their head on the ground. They don't know what it feels like. I remember one time, about six, seven years ago, a lady called and she was so stressed, so depressed. She said, I, I just want to end my life. Can I do one thing tonight? I just called this line because I couldn't find a number. Can you please just give me one thing? Don't tell me about Islam. I don't want to convert. Just tell me one thing that I can do that can just tranquilize me right now. And don't hang up the phone. I'll, I'm on the phone with you. But just tell me what to do right now. At that spur of the moment, no hadith, no ayah came to my mind. But subhanAllah, Allah gave me intuition, ilham, an idea. Tell her to make sajda. And so I said to her, I said, ma'am, excuse me, can you just put your forehead on the ground? Can you just kneel down? And she said, how, how? I said, well, kneel down. Put your knees on the ground. Okay, I'm down, down. What should I do next? I said, put your hand on the floor. Okay, both your hands. And she says, what should I do now? She's on the phone with me. I said, now put your head, your forehead on the ground. And just let it be there for two, three minutes. And I was holding on the phone, waiting for her. She got up and she said, Wow, mister, that was so soothing. Where do you learn from that? Are you a doctor? <laughs> I wish I was, so I can make that amount of money. <laughs> but no, I'm not a doctor. Well, why did you tell me to do that? I said, well, this is what we do five times a day. Five times a day? I said, well, not just five times a day. At least more than 25 times. Because in each rakah, you have how many sajda? So if you're praying four rakah, there are four sajdas right there, right? And then two of Fajr, right? Six, then four more Asr, ten, three more Maghrib, thirteen, right? 
17 times you are putting your head on the ground. This is just for the fard, not the sunnah and nawafil. Fard only. And, I, and this is not a fictitious story. This is not a made up con This is a real story. An American lady, I remember it was from Kalamazoo, Michigan, she called. And she said, I feel so relieved now. I feel so calm. And she went on to order a Quran and brochures. And even if she did not convert, so what? At least we delivered the message. Dawah is all about transferring knowledge. Remember, I keep stressing this again and again, and I can't stress enough. Dawah is not about shahada. I know people keep asking, how many shahadas do we have? Brother and sister, that's not our concern. Whether we have one shahada a day or no shahada a day. Our job is done the moment somebody received the message. The moment somebody felt spiritually uplifted. The moment somebody felt relieved. We are a blessing to this nation. Allah brought the Muslims to America as a gift, as a hadiyah, gift, blessing, to guide the people. Allah will guide them, not us. But He's using us as sabab. Musabib al asbab wa nahnu sabab. We are the sabab. So let us use our full potential to what Allah brought us here for, as a sabab. And let us be that sabab to transfer and relay and convey on. Let's move on quickly to the next one and we're running out of time. This is a strategy that we have made. Now, <coughs> it does not mean that you have to stick to this strategy. This is something that we in Y Islam came up with an idea, came up with a thought, a strategy called straw. Because when you are pressed for time, when you are short on time and you have to deliver the message of Islam, and you have to talk to people in the shortest amount of time possible when you cannot tell them about the whole five pillars of Islam, about the whole six Arkanul Iman, the pillars, articles of faith, when you don't have enough time to give the whole nine yards about Islam, and you got to do it short, you got to be concise, you got to be quick, you got to be fast, then at least you can talk about the basic. And where, what is the source of this? The seerah, the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Rasulullah Sallallahu lived in 13 years in Mecca. Am I right or wrong? For 13 years in Mecca, how many times he said fast, or give sadaqah, or give zakat, or pray, or do hajj, or umrah? How many times he did that in 13 years of Mecca? Huh? Really? Was he a Muslim? Why he didn't do that? <laughs> because some people they say, oh brother, you got to tell them about salah. Oh brother, you got to tell them about siyah. Oh brother, you got to tell them about hajj. Oh brother, you got to tell them about this. Hold it, hold it, hold your horses. Not the donkeys. Keep the donkeys away. Hold your horses. How many times did the Prophet do that? When Islam came in America, it's similar to Islam coming to Mecca. When you come for the first time, the 13 years in Mecca, Rasulullah taught about aqidah, belief, iman, i'tiqad. Once you make somebody firm in belief, the a'mal will come automatically. That is why the ahkam were nazil, delivered, Tanzil in Medina, the ayats of Medina, the Madini surahs, they talk about the ahkam, they talk about the furu, they talk about the ibadat and everything. In Mecca, it was all about building iman, iman, iman. So when we, when we look at the Makki ayats, Makki surah, and we look at the Meccan life of Rasulullah, the 13 years, we see three main things he focused on. Many of the hadiths start off with, مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Whoever believes in Allah and the last day. Huh? What about the other things? Belief in angels, belief in Rusul, belief in the books of Allah, Kitab Allah. Nothing of that. The hadith only mentions beginning two things. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day. Why? Why Rasulullah only shortlisted two things out of all the six things that we have to believe in? Can somebody tell me? Why these two things? Accountability. Because if you believe in Allah, yes, you want to say something? Those are the exactly. They are the imaduddin. The foundation of whole belief, iman, is on two things. Belief in Allah and belief in question. On yawm al-qiyamah, Allah will ask, what did you do? What did you do? If you have these two basic things, the other things will come automatically. Belief in the Anbiya, Rusul, Messengers, belief in the Angels, belief in the books of Allah, beliefs in life after death and all that will come. But Yawm Al-Akhir and Allah is the fundamental. That's why the hadith starts off, مَن يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرِ أَوْ يَسْمُتْ مَن يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيُكْرِمْ جَارَهُ Right? 
and that's all, and so on and so forth, many hadiths. So we take that hadith and we look at the Makki ayahs, Makki surahs. Allah in the Makki surahs, Makki ayahs, pounds and pounds again on three basic concepts, which are number one, Tawheed, T, Risala, Messengership of Rasulullah, Ra, Ra, or R, and Akhirah, A, Akhirah, T R A, Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah, Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah. These three things that Allah in the Quran, in the Makki Surahs focused on, and these three things that Rasulullah focused on in his Makkan Da'wah period. That Tawheed, oneness of Allah, one Allah, Tawheed, Risala, I am a messenger of Allah, I am Muhammad ibn Abdullah, alayhi salatu salam, I am a messenger of Allah. Qul ya ayu nas, inni Rasulullah ilaykum jami'an, Surah Araf, Allah SWT says that, O oh, Muhammad SAW, tell them, Qul ya ayu nas, Say, O oh people, inni Rasulullah ilaykum jami'an. I'm a prophet of Allah to all of you, jami'an. So messengership, risala, and then akhirah. Summa ilayna turja'oon. Inna ilayna iyabahum. Summa inna alayna hisabahum. These are ayats from the Quran, from the Makki surahs. Allah is saying, summa ilayna turja'oon. And then you will return to us. Inna alayna hisabahum. It is upon us to calculate them, to do their hisab, to do their hisab, a calculation of a'mal. These are Akhirah. Because when we talk about these three things, T-R-A, and we say, where does this T-R-A come from? It comes from Wahi, revelation. Kalam of Allah, Wahi. So it's Tra. So far, we have Tra. And what's the end goal of Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah, and Wahi? Hmm? What's the end goal of Tawheed, Risala? Shahada. Because if they got the whole thing, Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah, and wahi, it came through divine revelation. If they got the whole thing, the next thing they're going to say, how do I become Muslim? S. Shahada. You take a straw to drink. Why do you take a straw? To sip. What are you doing when you're taking a sip through the straw? What are you doing? You're inhaling, you're absorbing, you're intaking. This is Islam. I don't need to water it down like a straw. But the reason I'm saying straw that a straw serves the purpose of consumption. Consuming. You're consuming through a straw something, some product. It is going inside of you. If it's healthy and good, it will give you nourishment, nutrition. If it's bad, disastrous, it will have side effects. But this straw is healthy and spiritually uplifting and morally strong. Yeah? So we were saying about straw. Straw or Traw, the Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah. Now, if you focus on these three things, Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah, you can embed every conversation, every dialogue, and connect it to these three. For example, how do you make a connection if somebody calls or talks to you or asks you about hijab? You know, for example, hijab question. Somebody asks you that, oh, why do your woman, the Muslim woman, why do they cover their head? What do you call that? That, that rag that they wrap around their head? Well, it's not a rag, first of all, it's a hijab, not a hajib, like Mr. 44 said once in a presentation, that the Muslim women have a hajib. It's not a hajib, it's a hijab. And what is the purpose of hijab? To cover your beauty, to cover your attraction, to have modesty, morality. That's usually what we give answer, most of the Muslims. But there's a different way of looking at it. What is the purpose of hijab? And the answer that you would give in order for TRA, is to please my Lord. My Lord, my creator who created me, has ordained and obligated me that my beauty, my serenity, and my attraction is for my husband and none other but my husband. And that is the reason I cover my beauty so that when I step out of the house, any other man should not be attracted with lustful desires towards me. And this is all done for the sake of my Lord. Because my Lord, my God, Allah, revealed a verse to my prophet, messenger. See, T and now R, Risala, messenger. Lord does not talk directly to the human being. Lord, God, talks to human being through Risala, through messenger, Muhammad Wasallam. So Muhammad Wasallam taught his wives, taught his daughters, taught his female relatives to cover in such a manner. So now you are connecting from their question about hijab to T, Tawheed. To R, Risala. Now you have to connect it to A, Akhirah. How would you do it? I did the first two for you. How would you do the third thing? Any volunteer? Yes. 
Can you can we get a mic for him? I can use my voice. So everybody can listen. Since, since you obey Allah and, yes. uh, and His Messenger, mm -hmm. then will be basically going to go to Jannah. So that's Akhirah basically. Allah will ask you that. Okay, I heard mine. Go ahead. Did you follow my command? So and I will ask him in Akhirah, then you reward us to go to Jannah and we save from hellfire. So basically you're saying you, you will connect it to Akhirah by Day of Judgment, Yom al yes. That he will ask us, that I gave you this order, did you do it? Very good. Jazakallah khair. Excellent. This is it. That you are connecting the questioner, the one who asked you the question, you're connecting them to Tawheed, Risal and Akhirah from the answer that you're giving them. And the purpose of connecting that is to give this person that, who's listening to you, give them a sense of the whole picture. That it's not just worshipping about God, it's about next life. This life is temporary. We are living here for the eternal life. The life where there's going to be no death. And that concept needs to sink into the person. That look, that life is dependent upon my questioning on the day of judgment. If I answer all the questions right, I am successful. I am, you know, kamyab or successful. I am nafiq, you know, I have been productive. So now I will end in that bliss, in that eternity, eternity and eternal gift. But if my questions are all wrong on that day of judgment, then I might be in trouble, in a quagmire. So in that question, you are giving the concept, the concept to the person that number one, they need to connect with a higher authority, a higher supreme being, God, Allah, creator, master. Number two, you are giving that person who's listening to your da'wah message that you also have to connect to a human being on earth who was a man of God. And they are all the prophets. Jesus was a man of God. Moses was a man of God. Abraham was a man of God. You know, David and Solomon were a man of God. These are all men of God. Why did Allah send prophets and messengers on earth? To deliver Allah's message to humanity. And that is why we say that all the prophets of Allah were all from all, all the prophets of Allah were all brothers. And they all brought the same message. But again, sometimes they might ask you, if they all brought the same message, then why do I need to convert? Why do I need to become Muslim? I'm a follower of Jesus. And you say that Jesus is the brother of Muhammad. So I should be fine, right? Right? Yes. <laughs> You're saying yes. No, but all of them, why should I follow Muhammad? Yeah? Why should I follow Muhammad? What's the answer for that? Yeah, that's not a good answer. My messenger, Jesus, is great. And you said Jesus is exactly like Muhammad. So why should I leave Jesus and come to Muhammad? They all have different missions. One at a time, please. Yeah. They all have different missions. They all have different missions. Not a good enough answer. Yes. Allah said He will only accept the message, uh, the risala of Sayyidina Muhammad until the end of message. That's what He said. If that is the case, the brother said that Allah said that He will only accept the messengership or the message of Muhammad. If that is the case, that means all the other prophets brought bogus message. We don't need to believe in that. After Sayyidina Muhammad. Well then why do we desert them for Muhammad? Because Jesus is going to follow the Prophet Muhammad. Yes, that is when he comes back. But right now I'm a follower of Jesus. I should be fine. Because you are the one, you Muslim are the one telling me you believe in Jesus, right? And you say yes. Well then why should I believe in Muhammad? Jesus is enough for me. Yes? Yes, that brother right there. Yeah. So because uh, Jesus said the Bible to follow the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, ah. Bingo! That is the answer. Or like they say on, on, like they say on Sunday in church, Hallelujah! Welcome to the church. You have got the right answer, right? I went to a church once, just, just sharing a personal story. I went to a church once to give a presentation of Islam. <laughs> You'll be surprised. The people said, can you come next Sunday and preach to us, brother? <laughs> the pastor on the stage is like, oh my God, I'm not going to call this guy again. He's going to get rid of my job. So... People are receiving. People are conducive. They're conducting. They're conducive to the message. You just have to deliver. Look so naive. They're in the, sitting in the church and they're telling me, can you come back next Sunday and, and, and preach to us please? While their pastor is right there in front of them. <laughs> so this is what I'm saying. That the brother said, we have to deliver the message right from the source. You say, Jesus said, in Jeel, in Jesus, Isa Islam, in Jeel, he said, that after me there will come a prophet. His name is Ahmed. Or Muhammad, you have to believe in him. That's why you have to now also believe in Muhammad. 
Not because Muhammad is better than Jesus or Jesus is not good as Muhammad, but because Jesus said that. And likewise, the followers of Moses. Moses said, after me will come a prophet towards the end of time. You have to believe in him. Every messenger gave message to their people that you have to believe in the last messenger. Muhammad is not just a prophet for Muslims. He's a prophet for all mankind. So if you are a Jew or if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Christian or whatever you are, you have to believe in Muhammad in order to complete the message. This is how we interact and dialogue and converse for da'wah to the person. They may have a lot of questions, counter arguments, but I'm just giving you a small taste of it. That this is how it comes. That you have to link them to the concept. Yes, sister. <clears throat> no, they were just, I was doing the queue and they were answering, so we'll come to the Q&A because I asked a question about it. So if we move on, a lot of times there's conflict. People are aggressive. People are violent. They ask you very disgusting questions, disrespectful, insulting, humiliating questions, or they attack you in a very violent, aggressive way. You know, defame Islam, defame Muhammad Zulam, defame Muslims. In those situations, what are you to do? Number one, avoid saying negative things about there. Just because they're attacking your deen, your Islam, don't retaliate, don't start attacking. Don't say things like, oh, you worshiper of pigs. Astaghfirullah, la I've had Muslims saying that. And I said, brother, please, don't ever say things like that. You monkeys and pigs, you don't, you're not worth anything. No, don't say that. You are defaming Islam more by saying things. You know what Allah said in the Quran in Surah Al-Am? وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ uh, I forget the... Adwan. Allah is saying وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Do not curse. وَلَا تَسُبُّ Do not curse. Do not bad mouth. Do not say bad things or bad words to those people who worship besides Allah. Meaning anyone who's not worshipping Allah besides that. Don't do that. Why? For Yusubullah, then they will curse Allah in hatred, enmity. In your hatred, because you said something bad about their God. So now in that hatred, they will say something bad to Allah because of you. So were you a means of goodness or evil? Of course, evil. And Allah is saying that in the Quran. And that is why we need to avoid negative things. We need to acknowledge <clears throat> that they have the right to choose a religion. La iqraha fi deen, like I said before, there is no compulsion in religion, in deen. There is no forcing. You don't, we don't have to force people to become Muslim. So that is why we have to acknowledge that everyone has free will. And that free will is that if you, they listen to the message, if they like it, they accept it. If they don't like it, they have the right to reject the message. Just because they're not accepting the message does not give us any better right to force upon them. And remember, when we're dealing with conflict, we need to steer away from conflict. Somebody asked you a question. Why you guys keep blowing up buildings? Why do you guys keep chopping off people's head? I've seen those YouTube videos. You know, they say, Allahu Akbar, psh, Allahu Akbar, psh. I've seen those blood spilled on the floor. Instead of you getting focused, you're doing da'wah, right? Instead of you focusing on this issue, turn, change, steer the conversation. You are the captain of the ship. Why are you going swaying in their direction? They want you to come in this way. They want to pick a fight. They want to pick an argument. They want to start a debate. They want to make you look bad. They want to say, see, I irritated you. I provoked you. I put you towards the wall. There's no wall here. See, I kept moving back purposely. Because when people are bombarding us, we keep going backwards. Back foot, defense, 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 until we hit the wall. And then you say, I've run out of things to say. That's not the case. The case is, steer the conversation. They're talking about something negative. And you say, wait, wait a second. Let me tell you first something. Who gave us life? Probably if they are a bit spiritual, they say, God gave us life. You think the same being who gave us life, you think they're going to tell people to take life? Answer this simple question. Are they going to say, take life? He's the one who gave life. Is suicide forbidden in Christianity? Probably you'll say, yeah. No Christian pastor says, go commit suicide. No Jewish rabbi says, go commit suicide. It's halal. It's perfectly fine. So if suicide is haram in Islam, it is also haram in other faiths. 
Similarity, connection. Why? You're, see, you shifted them. They're talking about murder. They're talking about chopping heads up. You're shifting them to about life and end of life. If suicide, committing suicide is forbidden in all the major Abrahamic faiths, that means we have a common source, and that common source is God, Allah. That means He is the one who is the giver of life. The giver of life has also forbidden taking your own life. Are you getting the point that I'm coming across? Yes. That if somebody is forbidding you to take your own life, how can He give you the right to take somebody else's life? Because which is easier, taking your life or somebody else's life? You won't have this answer because you never committed suicide. <laughs> or you never thought about it. But as somebody who was on a suicide hotline, they'll tell you that people say, taking my life is easier than taking somebody else's life. Because I can just go, all right, I'm done. You know why people commit suicide? Why do people commit suicide? We get so many people on the y Slam hotline who are suicidal. And I have trained the people, I've trained the associates who take calls. I say, look, if you see somebody suicidal, give them the suicide hotline. You know, America has a suicide hotline, toll free number. All you got to do is just pick up the phone and say, I want to commit suicide. And they have trained professional counselors, psychiatrists on the phone trying to lure you away. Hey, you may laugh, but it's very sad. When I listen on the phone and somebody says, I want to commit suicide. I want to end my life. I literally cry. I know it sounds funny and we sometimes laugh, but believe me, brother, when somebody's saying that, they are in a lot of pain. And more pain than them, I am in pain. Because I, as a Muslim, I, as an ummati of Muhammad Sallam, I have failed them. I have not delivered the message to them. That is why they're thinking of ending their life. If Muslims are living in America, Muslims living here, and there are people trying to commit suicide, we have failed our job. We have failed our duty. We have not told them about Allah, the compassionate Allah, the Rahman Allah, the Rahim Allah, the Wadud Allah, the Hanan Allah, the Mannan Allah. If they knew about this, if they heard from us, you think they'll commit suicide? No. They need to know that there's a loving God who loves you 70 times more than a mother loves her child. We need to spread out the message. And that is why we need to focus them to acknowledge the good that they may be. Ask them, why are you thinking negative? Have you done something? Focus on one good thing you've done in your life. And you'll see, they'll tell you, he or she, they'll tell you, yeah, I did this good. And they'll start talking about the good. Even a suicidal person will tell you about a good thing that they have done in life. And that is your da'wah conversation dialogue. I know, we'll, I know you're raising hand, but we'll have question and answer after the salah. After the whole, we'll come back here. We'll have the q and I just want to quickly wrap up this. So we have to be careful in that conflict that we don't get embroiled in the conflict. We don't get entangled in the actual debate. Let's steer the conversation away from whatever they're asking. For example, they say, oh, your prophet is a child molester. He's a pedophile. Astaghfirullah. Instead of now you start focusing on defending Rasul let us shift. You are ill-informed. You don't know. Allow me to explain to you about Prophet Muhammad Sallam. And then you go on a whole long conversation. Five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, fifteen minutes. Talking about Muhammad Sallam. This is where your knowledge about seerah of Rasul Sallam. This is where your knowledge about the sunnah of Muhammad Sallam. This is where your classes that you took about the hadith, about seerah, about sunnah, will now come into use, utilization. You start using those events, those incidences, those hadith to tell them. Because they are attacking Muhammad Sallam with this title because they don't know Muhammad Sallam. We have to inform them about Muhammad Sallam. We are the followers of Muhammad Sallam. We are the ummati of Muhammad Sallam. So we have to inform them. Let's not focus on what they're attacking about him. Let's focus on informing about them. So that they can say, wow, the man that you tell me about right now in these 15 minutes cannot be this kind of person. You shifted the focus. Yes, you will still answer their question, but at the end. Not the beginning. Beginning start with the medicine. They came with the disease. They came with the sickness. You apply the medicine first, the cure, the remedy. And then at the end you can say, by the way, do you know in the dictionary, the Webster's dictionary, what's the definition of pedophile? Someone who chases kids around. Someone who has lustful desires chasing kids around. And the 15, 20 minutes that I spoke to you about my prophet, does it at all match? Did, he, did I tell you ever that he was chasing kids around in Mecca? Was he going around young, young 
kids. In fact, let me tell you something different. He married at the age of 25, at a hustling, bustling youth age. And guess what? At the time of age of 25, when you have the most lustful desires and you want a young woman, someone who is much younger than you, that you have a desire in your life, he married someone who was 15 years older than him. And he married someone who was a widow, who was already married. Does that sound like a profile of a person who would be dis lustful? And they'll say, no. What man would marry a 15-year-old woman? What man would marry someone who's not a virgin and who was a widow? You see how you use factual information to counter the poison, the venom that they are spewing against Muhammad Dawah is all about creative thinking. Dawah is all about thinking on your feet. The knowledge that you have about Muhammad Sallam, using it, utilizing it in a prolific manner, in a productive manner, to make that person realize that look, the hate speech that you heard or you read on some website about Muhammad Sallam defaming him like that, he is not at all that man. Because the character, the profile that you talk about of such a man would not do something. And he was loyal and married to her for 25 years. Would a pedophile do that? Would a lustful, desirous person do that? Would a womanizer would ever do that? He would have a lot of women around him. But for 25 years, as long as she was alive, Khadija he never married anybody. All the marriages he had was after the first wife died. You see how we are trying to steer them away from the negativity to the positivity, to positive. That is all about conversation. That is all about public speaking or private speaking. You know, public speaking, we think that when you're talking to a whole group of people. No, even one-on-one -on -one dialogue is public speech. When you're privately talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, you are giving that information to make them realize that they are coming from a negative mindset and you have to bring them across 180 degrees to a positive mindset. This is what Dawah was about. In Mecca, the Meccans who hated Rasulullah, they would go around and do negative things. They would spill you know, poison and venom against him. But it, whenever, whenever those people who listened to that poison and venom, whenever they met Muhammad they will be changed. They say, oh, he's not the man that they just someone told me about. You know, they accused him of being a liar, astaghfirullah. They accused him of being majnoon, madman. They accused him of being a fortune teller. They accused him of being a magician. And so and so forth. All these accusations are answered in the Quran. Allah said, he is not a liar, astaghfirullah. He's not a madman. He's not a magician. He's not a fortune teller. None of that. Because Allah is defending Rasul. We don't need to defend Rasul. Allah is defending him. Allah said in the Quran, Surah Ma'idah, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. O Muhammad, Allah is saying to him, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. Allah will save you, O Muhammad, from the people. So, so that is why the responsibility is to give the message and leave the rest to Allah. So now, after all this, the conclusion is, we conclude with this, is when you answer the tough question, your first goal should be to connect them to TRA, T-R-A-W, Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah, and Wahi. Whatever tough question, whatever conflicting, aggressive, you know, condescending question and comment or remark they pass, you think of your answer in such a way that it connects to those four things in one way or another. And if you don't know the answer to that tough question, you can always tell them, I can get back to you about it. Let me find out from someone who's learned. Remember, like the brother said, that if somebody is not ready for da'wah, he, he or she will do more damage. He's right. If, some, if you don't know the answer to something, don't start beating around the bush. Don't start making up an answer. That in my opinion, I think it is this. In my thinking, it is this. No, just tell them, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. I'll get back to you. Can I get your name and number or email? And I'll ask someone who's learned it. I'll ask someone who's knowledgeable and I'll get back to you. That is the way to approach. Instead of, uh, and there's no embarrassment, there's no shyness in saying that, I don't know. I know sometimes shaitan tells, oh, if I tell them I don't know, they're going to say, oh, you don't know your religion even? Why you don't know? <laughs> but that embarrassment, shyness is from shaitan. What's was of shaitan? And he said, look, I'm not a genius. I'm not a scholar. I don't know everything in life. So there's a lot of things we don't know. Do you know everything about Christianity? Do you know anything about Judaism? Let me ask you about Abraham. You know where did Abraham sleep? No. See, you don't even know about your religion. You just, you just threw a question like there. 
Of course, you don't know where he slept either. But you're just trying to <laughs> put them on a back foot. They're like, what are you talking about me? I don't know. You don't know about your religion. So they'll suddenly, they'll calm down. So, okay, all right, here's my number. This is my name. Let me know the answer to this question. So this is very important that we relate these tough questions to the proper answer. And if we don't know the answer, we can find out the answer from an imam, from a sheikh, or from any brother or sister who is more knowledgeable than us in the community, in the masjid, in the society. And then we can contact that person and say, look, you asked me this question last week or last month or whatever the case may be. And now here's the answer I found out for it for you. And here it is. So this way you build a rapport, build a connection. A lot of times we do open houses and I saw that Ikna here does open houses. A lot of times these people who come to the open houses, they come once and boom, they're gone, vanish. Did you ever see them come back again? Very rare it happens, very rare it happens in some message in America. that the person who came to the open house once, they come back again to you or they call the masjid or they call you or they connect with you. It's just one time event. They come, they listen, they go, boom. That means we are not doing good enough job. The purpose of the open house is building relationship, building a rapport, building a connection that you exchange numbers, their number and your number. So that if they have something, they can pick up the phone and say, hey, listen, I came to MCA at the open house. I met you over there. I had a question about Islam. Would you mind answering? This means that they have really benefited from the open house. Open house is not about giving nice, big, flashy lectures with PowerPoints on the stage. Open house is all about building one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I like this mini open house idea. Inshallah, I'll take that back to East Coast with the Ikna chapters over there. Because we always do big open houses with all these people. We need to have smaller ones where we have this casual discussion over tea and coffee, interaction, one-on-one. -on -one. Because it's all about building heart-to-heart -heart connection with the same gender, by the way. Just in case you thought. Imam is saying build hard hard connection. So now I got to build hard hard connection with Miss Jennifer now. No, I didn't say that. I said same gender. Because we have enough sisters available to build the connections on the sister's side. Of course, this question is not about a non Muslim, it's about a Muslim who has deviated or not practicing and going away. And so um, the questioner has asked, how can we give da'wah to them? The answer is simple. I know giving da'wah to your own loved ones, your own close relatives, your brother, sister, your mother, father, son and daughter is one of the most challenging and difficult da'wah. But the way to do that is through um, your character, your akhlaq, your demeanor, your interaction with them, your behavior with them and your manners with them, your etiquettes with them. And the biggest example is role model. Whenever you are in front of them, whenever you are with them, you are physically and practically practicing Islam and encouraging them and inviting them. And the simple answer is in the Quran that Allah says, And the believing men and the believing women are friends and protectors of one another. Ya'muruna bil ma'roof, they encourage each other on doing ma'roof, doing righteous things, good things, right things, and beneficial things. munkar, and they discourage from doing bad things, evil things, sinful things. So giving da'wah to Muslims is a very challenging, difficult task, but it can overcome through practicality, through role playing, through befriending them. A lot of times it happens is that we do not become friends with non-practicing Muslims. And then we desert them, we isolate them, we cut off from them. Oh no, they're not practicing, so we're not going to go to their house. We're not going to invite them to our house. We're not going to have any connection. But that is the wrong approach because if we don't befriend them, if we don't approach them, who is going to bring them to Islam? And that is why um, you know, it is very important uh, uh, to be close to them, to interact with them, to uh, bring them to events. If you are inviting people who are all, mashallah, practicing Muslims, invite your also your relative, your friend who is not practicing in that, so that they can f be amongst the environment, be amongst the surrounding that all are practicing, so they can feel the true lazza, the true taste of practicing Islam, inshallah. Uh, the next question we had is also a very challenging question. This is a question across America, whether you are on West Coast or East Coast. 
but I just got to know how bad it is in the West Coast. And that's the question of giving da'wah to homosexuals, especially with the rise of this uh, tide in this country and more and more legality and legal rights. I mean, we face this in East Coast also, but I don't know it's, uh, how bad it is in California. I just got to know today. So may Allah have mercy on us. Of course, the traditional approach to answering about homosexuality is talk about Prophet Lut and how Prophet Lut was sanctioned and commissioned by Allah to go to the city of Sodom. You know, Even the word sodomy comes from that city of Sodom. You know, this is a word in English language, sodomizing or sodomy. You know, once upon a time, and it was a long, not long, long time, but once upon a time, sodomy was a crime. It was a sin. But today it is a good thing. It is your legal right. Once upon a long, not long time ago, once upon a time, coming out of the closet, so to speak, coming out of the closet was a very bad thing. Today the closet is gone, it's broken. There's no more closet. Everything is open. So the approach should be is not to focus on the act that they're doing. Not to focus on the rights of homosexuality or the legitimacy of thing or that. Or not to say that this is a psychological thing. You know, a lot of times we say, oh, this is a psychological thing. Your brain is, needs to be rewired. You're thinking this way. And a lot, a lot of times the traditional da'wah we give is, oh, look, Prophet Lut al-Islam came and he told his people, you're doing a sinful act, a, you know, a crime, a disgusting thing, an abhorring thing, a very distasteful thing. That usual traditional approach does not get these people. The way to approach these people is love, compassion. Change the, t- you know, turn and change the tide around. Change the topic. Make them realize and feel that Allah loves them. That Allah is compassionate. That Allah is a loving God. Al-Wadud. All right? Allah loves them. And the fact that Allah loves them is that in spite of what they are claiming to be, Allah is still feeding them, is taking care of them. They have a clothes. They have food on their table. They have a roof on their head. They're not deserted. They're not, you know, punished. Who are we to ostracize people? Who are we to punish people? Who are we to judge people? Allah knows their heart, Allah knows their condition much better than we know. Still, Allah is giving them a chance. So we need to bring the positivity, the optimistic approach. That look, God loves you. God is the one who created you. Let's forget for a second, God created you as a man or a woman, or boy or girl. Let's just focus on God. Because you see, the thing is, as the ulama say, in terms of da'wah to such people who are on this track, if you bring them to the love of God, if you bring them to the closeness of God, when they start focusing on God, then they will start listening to the other arguments you have. You, you straight away start off with saying, Prophet Lut al-Islam, and he came to tell people that you have to become heterosexual, you have to leave homosexuality. They're not going to listen. You think the, the people of Lut al-Islam listen? They also rejected him. But Lut al-Islam, the approach he, the, the, the approach he adopted was of love and compassion. That Allah created you, Allah loves you, and the sign of His love is that He created you. You could have been born dead. There are so many children who are born dead in hospitals. You know, you can talk about, bring the discussion of stillbirths, you know, UNS, UNESCO, United Nations uh, Society of what, something like that, I forget. UN has a special statistics on stillbirths, the amount of stillbirths that happen in the world. And that's a sign you can use, that's a statistic you can use that, look, these children could have been a human being, but they were born dead. And any one of us could have been that. You or I could have been that. But the fact that Allah did not make us of those stillbirths, and the fact that Allah has given us the gift of life, we need to cherish the gift of life, this life that Allah has given us. Who gave us this life? God. Of course, they will counter-argue and say, I don't believe in God. That's a different issue. That's the issue of atheism. We need to differentiate between atheism and homosexuality. We want to focus on homosexuality. So when we are focusing on homosexuality, we can bring them closer to the love of God. What happens when you bring them closer to the love of God and make them contemplate and think upon Allah, you are basically striking in them a concept of belonging. I belong to a higher being. I belong to a supreme being. I have an attachment, a connection. When you... Put that belonging, then you bring in the thing that, look, if you 
really admire and appreciate this loving God, should we not honor Him? Should we not honor this God and Him by listening to His message? And then start from there. That This is His message. This is why He sent prophets and messengers. This is why He revealed revelations and divine scripture. And then you can go on to the other traditional approach of that this is not something by choice, uh, meaning uh, this is something by birth. God already chose our gender. He gave us, He produced us or created us biologically in a certain framework and mindset. I know it's very difficult these days giving da'wah to homosexuals, but there is no one right way. There is no one correct way. And one of the ways is what I just told you. This is one of the approaches. There are many other approaches that people may have, and you can share, and you can find out from other sources that may be there available from other online you know, organizations and communities and people who are working with them. But one thing that we need to focus on and bring them closer to focus on is the love of God, the appreciation of God. Uh, there are so many homosexuals who do still believe in a God, yet they don't believe in their creation of being in a specific gender. So at least if they believe in God, you have a starting point. But if they don't believe in God, and if you think that they have, and if they think that they have evolved from, you know, whatever they have evolved on, then that's a different approach. Then you have to use the methodology of talking to an atheist to someone who does not believe in God and use that strategy first to bring them to first acknowledge that there is a God. And once they have acknowledged, then you can use this approach of the love of God and the attraction of God and pleasing of God, that we need to please the Creator, the Master who created us. And the best way that we can do that is to thank Him for what He has given us. And the best way that we can thank Him is to obey His commandments and obey His directions that He has given us so that we are following that, inshallah. And um, there's another question about, uh, it's a general one, about the headscarf and the... And the question is very common, that sometimes people say that I am wearing this or I'm doing this because it is part of my religion. And then the counter argument they give is that, oh, but I met a Muslim, they're not doing it. I met a Muslim, they don't pray. I met a Muslim, they don't fast. I met a Muslim, they don't have hijab. I met a Muslim, they don't have a, you know, do this or do that. Why are you doing it? And I talked to that Muslim and they told me that it's a cultural thing. So the question that comes up is how do you differentiate to a person uh, between culture and religion, deen? And the best way to differentiate is to tell them that, look, there are always in every religion, there are people who don't practice their religion, their rituals, their ethics, their uh, worship. You may have a lot of people in Christianity, and they'll say, yes, we have a lot of Christians who don't practice Christianity, who don't really follow Jesus. In fact, Jesus never said to eat pork or pig, meat. Jesus never said to drink wine. But you have a lot of Christians doing that today. So you can show that, look, whatever the original, authentic teachings of Jesus were, people are not doing that. But that does not mean that it changes the teachings of Jesus. It changes the doctrine that Jesus came with. If people are not practicing something and they have developed a culture of traditional things, it does not change Islam. It does not change the deen, the religion. You have to differentiate. You have to say, okay, this is Egyptian culture and this is Islam. This is Pakistani culture. This is Islam. This is Indian culture and this is Islam. Don't mix culture into deen. So that is why you have to tell them that, look, that you may bump into a lot of Muslims who come from different cultural backgrounds. And whatever they practice in their hometown, in their home village, they have adopted it and they are doing it. And because they're doing it as a Muslim, so you think or they think that this is part of Islam, but it is not. It is a part of culture. Religion has nothing to do with that. And likewise, on the reverse, they may say that, oh no, we are Muslim. They are the one who is following their culture. They are the one, in our culture it is hijab, not in our deen. So you have to tell them that no. These things are from deen, from Qur'an, from the direct order of Allah. It is not culture. Culture could be in the choice of dresses, whether you have a long dress, long robe, or you have two-piece dress. That is culture, not Islam. Islam says that you have to just cover your body from, you know, from all the way top to bottom. 
and covering of your body is a requirement of Islam. Now, whether you cover that body in one-piece suit, clothes, or you do it in two-piece or three pieces, that is your culture background, your traditional society. Like you see Malaysian and Indonesians, their dress code is different. You know, they have different kind of culturalistic, you know, like dhoti and lungi kind of thing. You have people from Bangladesh, they have a different culture thing. You have Japanese people, Japanese Muslims, their traditional dress is different. You know, it's like a belt over here and a long robe. That is Japanese tradition, Japanese culture. But now that somebody became Muslim from there, they are putting uh, on that cloth. It does not mean that their cloth is part of Islam, and that's Islamic clothing. But that's a cultural thing. Islamic clothing is that it is a modest dress, it, is, it has morality, it has a haya, it, ha it is covering all parts of the body that's not showing or exposing your skin in a way to the other person. And that is how you try to uh, differentiate in front of them that look, you have to separate the two things the culture and the tradition and the religion. Religion, culture, and tradition are separate. And whatever you see a Muslim not doing, it does not mean that it changes Islam, that Islam has changed. The injunction is still there, the order is still there. They're not practicing it, that is their choice, their prerogative. But it is still there in Islam, and the proof of that is there are so many other thousands of Muslims who are practicing that thing in Islam. And the biggest proof is that the, the, the two sources of Islam, Quran and Hadith, talk about it and order it and obligate it. And that is how you differentiate between culture and religion. That's the questions I have over here. Now we can ask if anybody over here has a question. I have a question about the homosexuality that you spoke about. Uh, I've seen a documentary kind of scene um, wherein there are Muslims who are practicing fasting and praying, but they claim to be homosexual. So there is um, no way of inviting them to Islam because they accept and they claim that Allah has um, made them that way and Allah will accept them for what they are. So how do we handle these things? One of the most difficult questions of my life. Uh, can you put me off record, please, brother? <laughs> the other one, too. <laughs> I don't want to answer on record. In the Allah work, you often, I'm sure, find people who uh, have specific questions, right? Like, like you mentioned about the Prophet's character or you know, specific events in Islamic history and so forth. So those are specific questions, and you guys are probably sort of trained to answer those. But I feel like there's a lot of uh, people, a large category of people, who fall in, under this, you know, um, um, basically in this category where they are apathetic to... They are what? Apathetic. Okay. Like lack of... No interest or emotion uh, about not just Islam, but God in general, or spirituality. So, especially in the Bay Area, where I, you know, I feel like um, people are here are, are better off, you know, financially than other places. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they feel like they don't need anyone, any higher power uh, in their lives, right? Where they have everything they need, you know, financially. Uh, and everything. So when they get sick or you know any calamity affects them, they have a doctor to go to. They have a really good insurance plan and so forth. So, uh, how, what do you? How do you engage people who are just apathetic? And a lot of Muslims are also increasingly coming under this category where they just don't, don't care. They are, they're too busy. They have everything they need, right? So they're not like in the you know poor people in in, in different parts of the world who need. God, or you know, to sort of fulfill a, a you know a gap, uh, or they're you know poor or whatever. But people here who are well off, and if you try to engage them, they just don't care. Like I don't, I don't care about God. You know, I have other things to do. So just apathy, uh, and I, I feel like a lot of Muslims are increasingly coming under this this bucket. So how do you engage those guys? Very good question. And yes, you are right, there's a lot of Muslims, not just here in West Coast, even in East Coast. We see a lot of Muslims who just don't care about it. The biggest proof for that is Salatul Eid. 
Have you ever seen the attendance in Salatul Eid? Tell me, is Salatul Eid fard, wajib, more than Isha, Maghrib, Zohar, Asr, Fajr? These people are known as Eid Muslims. They only show up on Eid day. And that's it. You will never see them in the masjid. In fact, the management of the masjid said, where did these people come from? We made arrangement for 500 people, 800 showed up. That means they must be from that area, but they were hiding. And that's the apathy we're talking about. They don't care. But they have made it ritualistic. Oh, it's a day of celebration. Fine, it's cultural. Let me be with those people so that we have nice dress, mashallah, you know, thobe and shalwar kameez, and I'll be with my family and my friends, and one day of solidarity. And that's it. Rest, I don't care. How do you engage these people? Of course, you tell them about God, they're not even going to pay attention about it. But you engage them through test and trial and tribulation. That what would you do if suddenly overnight all of this was taken away? How would you survive? Do you have survival skills? Suddenly you lose a job, you lose your house, you lose your insurance, you are sick, you are dying in the hospital. Who's going to come and save you? Your family? They don't have anything to save you. Your money, you already lost it. Where is that? Meaning you, you make them realize and contemplate on a negative situation. You remember earlier we're talking about people who are already negative, you bring them to contemplate on positive things. Here people are already rejoicing. And I, and I know many people, even in my family members, in my relatives, there are many people who are exactly like this that you describe. And when I go to the traditional dawah and you know, celebrations or gatherings and, and I'm sitting with them on a the table, this is what I usually ask. What would you do if this happened? What would you do if that happened? And at that time, there are what I've seen in experience from response, at that time, it makes them start thinking. You make them scared. You make them realize. This, this, is, the, this is the methodology of Prophet Muhammad When he went on the mountain over there in Mecca, this is what he said, that if I tell you there's an army behind me coming right now to attack you, there was no army coming. But he said, he, imagined, he made them imagine that if I told you that an army is coming here to come and destroy you, would you believe me? They said, yes. He said, I'm telling you something even bigger than that. That there is Allah, Khalid, and he wants you to give up this shirk, stop worshipping these idols. Was there an army? No. But he used that strategy, he used that methodology, he used that tip to make the person emotion, because they are apathy, right? So you have to make them sink in the emotional quagmire of that situation. They have to visualize, what am I going to do in that situation? An army coming, attacking me, and my resources are not helping me, defending me. I'm helpless. So I better start thinking about God. Not believing, but let me start thinking. Because the people who are in this state of apathy, our job is only to make them think. Our job is not to convince them or to make them motivated to come and pray because they will never listen to you and come and pray. Our job is made them to think, what if this? What if that? What if this happens to you or that happens to you and you don't have this and you don't have that? What are you going to do? Do you have something? Because these people say, I, I have my bases covered. You know, these kind of Muslims that you're talking about, they always profess, they always, you know, um, show off that, oh, I have my bases covered, I have this much in the bank account, I have this best insurance, I have this doctor, I have this, this hospital, this guy knows me, I have this congressman, he knows me, I have everything covered. All right? You are talking about these are the means, asbab. These are all asbab. Who is the musabbib al-asbab? If Allah takes away all these asbab, what are you going to do? You're left high and dry. You're counting on your means today because they are there. And mind you, who gave you these asbab? Who gave you these means in the first place? Who gave you this job? Who gave you that connection to the congressman or the senator or the governor? Who gave you that connection to that doctor or that hospital? Who gave you that amount of wealth that's sitting in your IRA or in your 401k or your mutual funds? Who gave you this talent, this skill that you were able to earn so much? Because they were equally talented and equally educated as you, another person, he doesn't have that much. So remember, it's not, a, it's not the product of your effort only. It is also the blessing of God. Because that person who graduated from your batchmate, your classmate, worked equally as hard as you, but he did not have all of these things that you have. That means there is a divine intervention somewhere. There is a divine interaction somewhere that he has blessed you with this and not blessed him with that or her with that. This makes the ball rolling for them. They start thinking. Our job is only to make them think. 
Because if they start thinking, when they sleep at night on the bed, it'll, it'll say, what's your name, brother? Nabil. They'll start thinking on the bed, you know, Nabil, bhai, brother Nabil really made a point. And it starts making them thinking. Why did Nabil tell me that? Why did brother Nabil ask me that? Because you have really touched the heart. You have pinched. Remember, these are desensitized people. They are totally senseless about Allah, about deen, about akhirah. So you got to give them electric shock. You know, <laughs> that the, or the paramedics, they bring those things. I, I will see that like, I said, we need to do this for Muslims sometimes, you know. Like put over there, okay, one, two, three. <laughs> you are resuscitating them. They are on life support. So you got to make them alive. And this is the shock you got to give them. Joke. What if this? What if that happened? What if you do this? What if you do that? Oh, I never thought about it. Really? Why didn't you think about it? Oh, this will never end. Sure? Are you sure this will never end? There are so many people around us, we've seen it ended. Their money ended. Their wealth ended. Their children ended. Their job ended. Their business ended. They came to row. They became homeless. You say it's not going to happen to you? What guarantee you have that it will not happen to you? Case closed. Next question. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair for excellent workshop. I have a question on uh, how to give dawa to your co-workers and especially people in the upper management uh, who are Muslims but uh, they have gone, they are not practicing and gone astray to the point that they are openly drinking in Ramadan on Friday happy hours and completely fine with that and uh, I just wanted to get your take on how to talk to them about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a Dao Roshab to give Dao to non-Muslims. But yes, I, I know these questions are also valid. Um, how to give Dao to your fellow Muslims. In this situation that you're telling, <laughs> please don't mind, uh, don't criticize me, but I usually tell uh, the answer. Have that brother talk to a Tablee Jamaat guy. He'll have it in a snap. You know, SubhanAllah, we have to give due credit where it is. You know, I know I'm not part of Tablee Jamaat, I'm part of another organization, but I admire and appreciate the effort and work of what these people are doing. No, we should not have this uh, stinginess. We should not have this jealousy, animosity. That all, don't talk about another jama'ah. These are all Muslims. They're all working for the sake of Islam. I, you, them, him, her. We're all working for who? For Allah. And one thing the good we have seen is that when the brother goes with them for three days or 10 days or 40 days, in that environment, they get that shock wave treatment. They begin to realize, where am I? Who am I? What am I doing? Why can't Ikna do that? Or why can't uh, CARE or any other Muslim organization or Gain Peace or Islam do that? Because there is a special ingredient that Tablighi Jamaat has which these other organizations don't have. And you know what that ingredient is? Anybody know? Anybody had an, an interaction? By the way, I've been in Tablighi Jamaat. I've gone for 40 days. So I know the ingredient. Anybody have a wild idea what the ingredient they have? Jazakallah khair. Mahal, environment. Sometimes you have to snatch the person out from the environment. Literally pick them out. Put them in a different environment. When you are sleeping and eating and drinking in a masjid, when you are staying 24 hours inside a house of Allah, there is special barakah, malaika are there, special spirituality, waking up in the masjid and praying 3 in the morning, tahajjud, it brings rejuvenation of the soul, the soul that was almost dead and thirsty for, uh, for nur, for uh, tamanina, for ruhaniyat, that soul suddenly starts tasting, oh, this is a food I like. So temporarily when they come back, they might get rejuvenated, they may get away from these things. By the same time, don't take me wrong, I'm not saying that you know, other Muslim organizations cannot do this thing for that person. They can also do it, but they have not been successful as much, as much as this organization because of the ingredient that I said, environment. So how can other organizations do, how can Ikna or Islam do, is bring them into a convention, bring them into a seminar, a three-day workshop seminar environment where they are constantly being bombarded with spirituality. The kind of symptom that you tell of a person is a spiritual sick person, spiritually diseased, malaise. So obviously when somebody is sick, sometimes you have to quarantine them. You have to, why do they, 
Why do they admit you in the hospital? Like, if you go with some problem, some symptom to the doctor in the hospital, they say, oh, we need to admit you. He said, no, 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 I want to stay home. I'll keep coming. No, 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 we have to put you here. We have to fix you here. You are admitted in the hospital for six days, five days. They treat you, and then they release you. The doctor comes, okay, today you can go home after five, six days of treatment because that was necessary for the body to be cured. Similarly, the ruh, the soul, the ruh needs a hospital, a place where they can be rejuvenated, resuscitated. Inshallah, next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh Jawad. We benefit a lot from uh, this workshop. I myself uh, learn uh, you know, the technical of the da'wah, especially when we, for non-Muslim or for the revert, and uh, uh, the, especially the art of da'wah, the technical, you, you explain it, Jazakallah khair. Um, well, yeah, and we, inshallah, we can deliver it in the society. Sure. And my, uh, and I was wondering if, uh, because there is, uh, when the non-Muslim come, they go to the masjid and they send them to the imams. And some imam, uh, actually, they have the, this art and the fun of da'wah, uh, alhamdulillah. But some other, they don't have it, especially some fatwa. Yani make the peop make them go away from Islam. Yes. And I was wondering if you uh, if if it's possible to cooperate with each other to create a workshop for the imams. Imams and it's not I don't I don't mean the this mosque or that mosque uh, to avoid this conflict because Every uh, non-Muslim, whether it came for marriage or came for, they sent them to the Imam. And uh, sometimes they need counseling also. And what about if we make workshop, like for me, for example, I benefit a lot today from you, Jazakallahu Khairan. And uh, because the Imam in touch much with the non-Muslim for da'wah and for example, they come and they say, Shahada, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Even when we uh, introduce this, I think we, we make it, some of our Imams, may Allah bless them, it's not enough, yani they, and just hug and hug, and after that, uh, no follow up with this uh, new Muslim. Uh, this is why workshop, I think, for the imams, and you can add for the leadership of the community. There is a lot of volunteers in every mosque, and every organization. They are very active. This is to save your time, actually. And we, the other people are going to learn from them. And uh, one more thing about the tarbiyah. I, I, I uh, suggest for myself before uh, the brother in Tarbiya to, uh, to give a more effort workshop for the Tarbiya for, because if you don't have it, you can't give it. يعني, like Tarbiya Ruhiya, ruhiya يعني, like Qiyam al like uh, uh, part of the Quran, we should uh, ask them every day, like, it's called يعني, preparation like uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, at the beginning, Allah prepare him. Ya ayyuha al-muzzammil, qum al-layla illa qalila. Preparation. Why? Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. And this yeah. preparation actually we need it in the tarbiya of uh, uh, our why Islam or ikna or even for the imams, even for the volunteers. This is actually, uh, we're going to give a lot of uh, energy for uh, saving time at the same time and smart work. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wa iyaikum. InshaAllah. Barakallahu fiqh. You are very right, brother. We had a call on 8 Cents and Why Islam uh, a few months back. A, a, an African-American reword, he converted in, in a masjid. He took shahada and he became Muslim. And he wanted to marry an Egyptian girl. And she was ready. She wanted to marry him also. But she said that, you have to talk to my father. If he agrees, then I can marry you. If he doesn't, then I cannot. So he went. 
And you know what the father said, the Egyptian father said, I cannot marry my daughter to you. You are black. And he said, I converted to Islam because I thought your prophet said there is no, uh, you know, exactly. I'm, if I'm black, is that my fault? I'm Muslim. Eh, no, 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 Islam is good. Yes, the prophet will say, but you are black. And we're Egyptian. We're from Qahira. So I will only marry someone from Qahira. So then he said, what should I do? He said, go talk to the imam. This relates to what you said. He said, okay. He went to his local masjid, the same masjid where that, you know, that family, that Egyptian family also goes. And he went to the imam and he said, I want to marry so-and-so daughter. And the father, he said such and such like this. So what do you say? You're imam. Is he right or wrong? He said, yeah, he's right. You cannot marry him. You are aswad. You're black. Imam saying that. And this guy, he, to- he called the hotline to say, I want to leave Islam. If this is Islam, I don't want Islam. Because your imam is saying, that person is right and I'm wrong. And he's saying, and he said, did you ask the imam, why is he saying that? He said, yeah, yeah. He, he told me that, look, we, the, because the imam was Egyptian also. And what, it, uh, what this brother told me later on, also in the conversation, that it turned out that that brother, Egyptian brother, whose daughter he wanted, he was on the board of the masjid. So you know where the connection is going, right? He's the imam, he's in the board. So <laughs> the imam said that, yes, we Egyptians, we don't marry to anyone outside Arab. So if you are Arab, then maybe you could be married, but you are a black American over here. So he's right. I mean, he has the right to say no to you because of culture, because of your background, your race. So now this person is saying, I want to leave Islam. Who is making him leave Islam? I leave the answer with you. There have been many examples like this. People called the White Islam hotline and said, I went to the mosque, I went and talked to the, ma- the, the imam at the mosque, and he said this, this, this to me. I, it doesn't make sense. Is this right? And we tell them on the phone, no, that's wrong. Imam is wrong. Whatever he told you is wrong. So you're right. Imams, there are many of them who do need training. But again, there are many imams who don't need it, and they're much doing good job. But many of the imams in many massages in America do need training. And in White Islam... We are now, right now in the uh, development phase of making a workshop, a seminar, a tarbiya seminar, training workshop for just exclusively for imams. I'm in the process of doing that, working with some brothers over there in New Jersey. Inshallah, once we have that ready, we have the irada, we have the intention, niya, to have and hold just one workshop just for imams. So that they know the intricacies, the delicacies, the, the protocols, the, the, the discipline, the methodology of how to deal with somebody who comes up to you. Because like you said, Imam is the main focused person in the masjid. Whoever non-Muslim is coming to the masjid, everybody say, go to the Imam, go to the Imam. But if the Imam says something that turns off, that drives the person away, it's going to be bad. And the second thing you said of tarbiya, yes, we need to have tarbiya. We do tarbiya seminar over there in the uh, East Coast, in many masajid. Why Islam tarbiya seminar or ikna, actually we do ikna tarbiya seminar where we have ruhaniya, you know, spirituality. We have one whole day, one night, or two days in the White Islam Center, in the masjid, or in any masjid, and we bring uh, some scholars, some teachers, and we do some, you know, dhikr, athkar, some ma'amalat, we do some, you know, talks and some uh, ibadat also to bring the spirituality in that tarbiya seminar. So that is also important, inshallah. Any more questions before we look good? I think if people are going now, it's also tired. <laughs> yes, one last question. One last question. Okay. Any, any from sister side? Okay. Okay. How should our approach be sh- for the reverts, or maybe not reverts, uh, who are uh, psychologically unstable? Psychologically unstable. Yeah. And they're revert. Yeah, reverts. Hmm. I had to grant Yeah, we need to we need to build on that. We need to have a strong mentorship program. And um, especially with these people, they need a lot of they need a lot of support. We don't have enough support. Our volunteers, our volunteer mentors who are there, they they feel sometimes scared to talk to these people or if they are even talking, they don't have enough time to support them. So we need to have specially trained people, Muslim volunteers who can mentor these uh Char- mentally char- you know, challenged people or mentally sick people with psychological disorders. And we don't have the expertise right now, but we need to build that. And that is a big challenge right now in any organization uh, for that. 
but there is no solution right now, unfortunately. Yes, the, the best thing you can do is spend time with them and be with them, bring them to the masjid, go around, you know, socialize with them, make them, tr treat them like a normal person, normal human being, and at the same time, bring them to activities, the masjid activities. The best way to connect a revert is to connect them to the masjid. Whatever activity is happening in your local masjid, try to invite the revert over there. If they cannot come, go and pick them up, drive them over. So you bring them, you befriend them. Because these people, they need love, they need compassion, they need friendship. They don't have so many people in their circle of friends. So they are isolated. So we need to bring them into the mainstream of the Muslim community, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Right, we'll end inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illallah nastaghfiru wa natubu ilayki. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi just want to say Jazakallah khair. <coughs> Jazakallah khair for Brother Jawad Ahmed coming from all the way there and uh, giving us the workshop. And we went two hours ahead, so Jazakallah khair for accommodating your time. And Jazakallah khair for all of you to be here. So as I said, inshallah, we'll be in contact. So we'll conclude today. So assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.